Okay, zoom in some. So we're looking for homework. Okay, so um, there could be a typo that's right. Um, yes, so uh, thank you for checking that. Um, this is a copy, copy paste error on my side. Um, it does say provide the best fitting value for source depth, but then in brackets it says XS and it should really say ZS. Um, so if that confuses you, um, um, I can update that in the in the in the notebook environment. Otherwise, um, you know what we're looking for is the source depth, which is the variable Z. And uh, I apologize for. I probably had that wrong in other versions of this notebook also. Nobody ever pointed it out. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is ZS. Um, yeah, so the um, um, so the, the question one one is is more like um, you know the answer to the question one one is more like modify the script. Um, so the, the, the one one is to modify the script that's up here to uh, do the search over Z and do the search over the volume. Um, and then you're right, uh, the, the uh, result for the running the script is where, which goes into 1.2a. So there's a little bit of overlap. 1.1, um, if that were like, if you, get, if you would get points on the question, 1.1 would be for for modifying the script in 1.12a is then for providing the results of the script. So, and then 1.2b is, is separate. That is uh, replotting the uh, misfit function, which is that two dimensional plot that shows the best fitting um, source parameters in sort of a, a color plot that shows you the shape of the misfit function. So that's a little bit different than 1.1. Did that make sense? Okay, good. Uh, regarding this question, I was thinking about it gives a elongated shape. Uh, is it fine, or I, I am making some mistake? No, that's. Uh, do you have it? Do you have it up? Do you want to show it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. It's it's a kind of uh, elongated shape. While in in the in the X Y we have a like a very symmetric kind of. Yes. So this is correct. Um, um, the um, the misfit function for the X Y search, if you keep about the, the same uh, uh, grid spacing, will look. Uh, reasonably circular, mm -hmm. while for the VZ, the search of depth versus volume, you mm -hmm. see that as some sort of, um, the shape is not circular, it's more elongated. Um, and uh, does anybody have any idea why that is? Uh, it is correct. Uh, so the shape is what you expect to see. Anybody uh, have any thoughts of why it might be like that? I think there is, uh, uh, it depends on the relationship where we have X and Y, we have as, uh, I mean, we are on the over the surface and, yes. and uh, regarding volume, it can be, it, it doesn't make any sense of this relationship for me. I mean, volume and depth. Yeah, so if, if you look at this plot, and um, so you see the star, which gives you the, the, the least misfits between the two data sets. Yeah. But you yeah. see there's like, a, 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 you can almost call it a trough, like a, a line along which you could move that star a little bit. 
you know, mm -hmm. if you move it up and down that line without really changing the misfit much. So there are several solutions, uh, several combinations of volume and depth that will lead to a very similar misfit. And um, what this means is that there is some sort of a correlation between those two variables. They, they are not fully independent. Um, it's not uh, as straightforward as for X and Y to um, separate out the, the depth variable from the volume variable because they are somewhat correlated with each other. So that's one of the issues always of using uh, MOGI models is that there's a relationship between those two. Um, and there are several combinations of volume and depth that will lead to mm -hmm. a very, very similar deformation pattern on the surface uh, and, and uh, are you know, nearly as likely, uh, need to lead to nearly as good of a misfit. And then I, I also changed the, these parameters like uh, depth parameters because in this I used from one, uh, from one, to, uh, one to eight. If I change this, uh, and the relationship remains same. I mean, there it, and there becomes a bit more right. a misfit function also in this region, but the the yes. I mean the shape remains same. Yes, because there's a physical correlation between those two variables. Okay. I'm sure Gareth wants to say more about the issue of volume versus depth. As oh really? Yeah, I was being flippant when I said it was a linear relationship. <laughs> I mean, technically speaking, it isn't, but the, the two it's, are it's correlated. It's a non-linear relationship. So yeah. you, could put, you could pull a straight line through the middle of that that um that field that you've got there, and all of the models that are, that fell on that line would fit about the same. Um, and and Riley had it right in in, in the chat that um see the chat that it, it kind of stands to reason that I mean, the the closer the source is to the surface the less volume change you need to get approximately the same surface displacement so you bury the source deeper you need more volume change um, okay and they yeah. all fit about the same <laughs> they all fit about the same yep and a few a I have oh yes. Yeah. I have a few other questions related to some uh, yesterday's exercise, but if someone has this uh, problems related to this, so I, we can discuss later about that. Okay, but the function overall looks good. Um, 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 so, so the shape of the function is what you sort of expect, because there's a trade-off. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the one thing I might advise you to do would be to, to, to focus in a little bit, maybe. You've, got, mm -hmm. you've searched a very wide parameter range there. Um, but of course, all you'll you'll see basically the same kind of pattern. You just yeah. might be able to focus in a little better on. Yeah, um, initially I tested around uh, five five uh, from from one to five, and also these parameters. Later on, I expanded it a bit, so I will focus it more. Very cool. Okay. And uh, if if no one has questions, so then I can I can discuss about this problem. The downsample DM problem. And uh, this is related to tops processing. Okay. Do we have? Uh, uh, is Harish is on? I think right. That's why I'm right yes, here. I'm here. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, in the in the in the morning hours, I asked about the interface uh, uh, subswas one and two. I processed the data of the region of my interest, but I think there is something wrong because I you I select interferometric two and three, but there is only three. Um, can you can you go uh, up to your uh, XML file, mm -hmm. the top sub that XML? This one, uh, a little bit up. Uh, this one, I changed it here. I think I made something wrong. No, this this looks good. Oh, the region of interest might not um, cover your other subswat. Are you sure? No, that? Uh, and the other thing I noticed was you were when you did the listing, it only lists IW three because it that's the directory that you're listing. 
you change the IW3 to IW2. Oh yeah, so let's open a terminal. I mean, are you sure that you don't have it? Or let's look at one of your figures, maybe down. Let's, yeah, let's uh, because I, I, I selected the region, this one, and I give the parameters from here to here and the earthquake is somewhere here. So in the region, we have overlap of uh, their earthquake that is occurred have deformation in subswat two and three. So oh, it, it has right. it has uh, given me results only for subswat three. I can show you figures. So then it would be. Uh, go to the where where did it list the downloaded? The, uh, I also checked there was only interfer. Um, okay. you change the, the, if you change three to two in that command right. there, if you go up to uh, to that command where it lists you all the um, RW three, all your overlaps. Uh, no, I think it's further down. The one that you showed at the very beginning. Uh, okay. IW three stuff. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you passed it. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Just you go very look gently out. <laughs> specifically change. look in the IW3 folder. So if you change that to IW2, okay. you should see so that. I have to change IW2 and IW3 slash. Yeah, this, is just to, this is just to look at the directory. And so all the IW2 files, if you downloaded them and it processed them, will be in the IW2 directory. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, if you rerun the cell, it shows you all the content of IW2. Yeah, it oh. doesn't exist. The reason that it doesn't exist to me, um, it's probably your region of interest is small. It only falls in IW3. So, oh, okay. so that gets priority and um, it doesn't it doesn't extract more data for you. So you're, can okay. you go back to the top sub XML? The region of interest looks very small to me. And is it even in the? It's uh, forty point four to so, forty five point four. Does that yeah. even cover Croatia? Yeah, that's yeah. seventeen small. degrees north to seventeen point three five degrees north. There's way south of where yes. you are. Yeah, yeah, that's very small. Definitely very small. And if probably the wrong area. We're probably not in the right place. Um, seventeen. I found it from here, <laughs> like. And uh, 45, 45.3 to. Oh, does it go longitude, latitude, or latitude, longitude? Yeah, it's latitude. And okay. then uh, from here to up to. Okay, so maybe I made a mistake for this yeah. one. Yeah. No, the numbers, the numbers are very small, what you showed. It's. Okay. It's yeah. 20, 20 kilometers or something. Yeah. Just, just yeah, so very wide the bounding box corners. Um, yeah, I will, I will make it. Uh, I will expand it, then run again. Maybe then. But, uh, but please, uh, please show your results. Uh, it was very interesting. Yeah. What you went through. Go, go down where you had the unwrapped interferograms. I saw some. Uh, where you had the unwrapped interferograms and the yeah, no. components. That was very interesting to point something out. Yeah, so this clearly, this is a more noisy interferogram compared to what, yeah, here. Yeah, this yeah. is a more noisy interferogram. If you scroll down a little bit to show the connected components. So you see what we, yeah, yeah go, go a little bit up. So we see the different colors of the connected component. Uh, here? Yeah, this one, yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So, Yesterday, the interferogram that I processed, which is in the notebook, was more coherent. Mm -hmm. And we really yeah. had almost one connected component. But here we see that there is one big connected component. And there are those smaller connected components, different colors. So each color means one region. It means the unwrapping can be trusted within that region. But there is no guarantee that those regions uh, have um, right integer number of two pies between them. So it's really, it's a good QA uh, metric for, for uh, INSAR community, I would say, this, this map. Yeah. 
So you guys should really get used to it, to, to take a look at the connected components. And it totally makes sense because your interferogram is more noisy. Yeah, I also process this with the, with the, with the GMPSR. Mm -hmm. It's like this one. Yeah, it's, it's more filtered. So you can- Yeah, it's, it's, it's filtered one. Yeah. yeah. And it has the, uh, probably the um, subswath that you want. Yeah, it's the third and uh, third subswath. Yeah. And uh, the second one is here, but I, I, I had that, but I had, I tried to find it, but it is, I think on my other computer. So I will, I will merge them. Then I will show, show it, check it again. Cause I, I actually, I wanted to, uh, I had that data and some information. So that's why I tried this in, uh, region for the, for the atmospheric noise effects. And a little bit out, let's see what was the wrapped interferogram one more time. There you go. Yeah, very similar. It's just yours in the uh, ice results, you haven't filtered enough, which yeah. doesn't mean bad. I mean, it's just really your choice as you will get experience with these kind of difficult interferograms. Then yeah, uh, the user needs to be aware that yeah, the other one is just more smoother yeah more, more multi-looking and more filtering which can be done by the way outside any interferometry software you there are many tools just for filtering right mm -hmm. okay thanks for sharing and uh, third uh, so i i am not uh, i mean i did not understand very well about uh, this one where we would where we put IW3 for the list of uh, interferometric. If we select IW3 and so I, I can show you that scale there. So I have to put here IW3 oh, or no, IW2. No, 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 it... that, that's just a simple LS comment to see what is in that directory, right? But you already yeah. did, uh, we, were, we were trying to see if it exists at all the IW2. So okay. in, a, in a case that your processing goes through with both IW2 and IW3, uh, in this directory, for example, you would have another in overlaps, under overlaps, mm -hmm. you would have another folder called IW2. Yeah. Uh, so okay. um, yeah, each subswat would have one, one subfolder. That's what we mean. But to get okay. there, you need to either comment out the region of interest or, mm -hmm. or choose a bigger region, region of interest. So if you comment it out, it's gonna process all the births from mm -hmm. SWAT two and three, because you chose two and three. And if you comment out SWATs, it's gonna process whatever births available in your data. And uh, it, uh, one, two, and three are gonna be processed. But I think, I think clearly your region of interest is very small and you mm -hmm. can okay. expand it a little bit. And for the third, for the last question, for for this about the DEM, because it was for the previous example we have run yesterday. So what should I do? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so this uh, the, the script, sorry, you should have fixed it. A little bit has changed in the GDAL. So this goes through actually. Um, after this, uh, you can just where it fails is at the very last step. If you look at the error message, it says GDAL to ice XML. So I did not run it yet. So <laughs> let's let's fix this. Let's let's fix this. Uh, basically, don't ignore this error message. Let's insert mm -hmm. a cell. So cell, go to cell and insert a cell uh, uh, after this one. Uh, go to insert sorry. cell below. Cell below, yeah. And say GDAL2 ice, um, GDAL2 ice uh, XML, um, the hyphen XML.py. I even put it in the, uh, in, the chat. in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I put it in the chat. Okay. Bit. 
Oh yeah, so if you go up uh, the chat message, oh, you, you posted one more time. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And since so, it's, it's a so, common, just add that exclamation mark at the very beginning, similar to the uh, cell down. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just add it at the beginning of your new cell. Yeah. Now run that one. Okay. I think now then uh, you should be all set. Basically, you have the course cursor DM and mm -hmm. ice compatible, and you should be fine. Okay. Next. Uh, so I have to run these, and then yeah, and then okay, the rest yeah. of it should be fine. Okay. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, sure. There was a question about intro to raster data. Is that about uh, how to create a net RC file? Is, this, is that the question? I don't know how to use the net RC file and how to change its settings. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe the yes. Um, Easiest thing for us is to post that someplace in in the Slack channel so that um, a lot of people seem to have issues with creating the NetRC file. There's, if you actually Google for it, um, you know how to create a NetRC file, it gives you sort of step-by-step -step instructions too. Um, and maybe that uh, helps then if you if we put that in Slack of what the net RFC file should look like and uh, how to create it. Uh, I, I put a link, I had already put that link in the Slack and there is the link in the chat now. As, okay. as Fran said, that's from some, some of the earth data stuff. So yeah, just, just step one, it should work. Um, have, you, have you tried that step and it didn't work? Uh, who is it? Bahare. Bahare, you can you can sort of try these instructions. That's okay, Bahare. So so uh, look at these links. Um, especially the first one that Haresh posted, um, which shows you how to set up the uh, NetRC file and what it needs to contain and see if that works for you. Oh, I see a question from Jesse about range offsets. Yes, this. Jesse, do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, should I share, try to share my screen? Yes, please. Real quick here. Can you see my screen? Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I know where that earthquake is. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I, I, it's a really nice uh, interferogen. This is an earthquake um, somewhere over China uh, that happened earlier this year. And my question was about, I really wanted to try out this range offset function. Um, so I'm just gonna go down to the results of that, which looked really cool. And I just wanted to ask about how um, you would interpret, interpret the units. I'm assuming that the, the range offset units are positive in this increasing range elevation direction and positive in the, so this is a ascending pair um, in this direction here for the azimuth offsets. You would interpret um, you... range offsets similarly to INSAR in that they're measuring the same quantity, basically, um, displacement towards or away from the satellite. But in this case, you're, you're getting at it from, from um, image offset, image correlation, not, not, um, yeah. um, not, not phase. And, um, which means that they are more robust in the near field often. Uh, they don't decorrelate in the same way due to damage. 
Yeah, um, this bit really here comes out super. Looks crazy. like there's a splay in the fault there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and the units. I mean, the unit is the unit is pixels. So it's yeah. the range pixels because you are you are showing range offsets. So it's it's in slant range to be more more precise. It's in okay. the slant range direction, and as as Garrett said, it's exactly in the line of sight that you do interferometry as well. Okay. In, in an ideal world, it would be four pi over lambda times this would be exactly your interferogram, and it is. It's just noisier. So, but but the units are pixels. You have to turn it to meters. One pixel is around two point four meters. Um, so, is there anywhere in any of the metadata that you could actually just grab the the pixel size? Yeah, yeah, we should have it somewhere. Probably, are we mentioning it in the notebook? Otherwise, I will put it either in the chat or in the Slack. Right. Uh, that's, okay, that's you have to you have to multiply this by the slant range pixel spacing. Cool. Thank you. Great example. Looks gorgeous. The question about uh, enhanced spectral diversity. Um, Top's question is ESD used only for estimating the azimuth shift between bursts, or is it also related to the azimuth shift between reference and secondary same burst? Is the correlation azimuth accuracy of 10 to the power of minus 3 needed because of burst alignment? Uh, let's see if I fully understand the question. Azimuth shift between bursts. I can give it a try. So the, um, yeah, we the, the goal is to, uh, to estimate um, between the reference and secondary. That's our goal, definitely. We are looking at burst overlaps um, and we are making interferograms uh, from different overlaps between the um, uh, reference and secondary. Um, and then we double difference them. So it's not only for one image. It's really, we are not synchronizing the burst in one image. Isa has done an, amazing job on that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to use tops. So we are not synchronizing the burst in one image. They, ha they are synchronized uh, more than um, uh, needed. So, so it's really about the uh, between the reference and secondary. So there is that shift that we are interested in. And yeah, the, the, in, in theory, yes, as, as it's in the notebook as well, we need 1,000 of uh, pixel accuracy just because of that extra Doppler variation that there is a linear Doppler um, and even a constant shift would cause a phase ramp. While in strip map, a constant shift, a constant shift would cause only a constant uh, phase. So you wouldn't see that in a strip map data set. The tops because of its uh, property uh, which has that extra Doppler in azimuth direction, a constant shift, shift causes a phase ramp, which then the difference between the two phase ramps uh, long track between two bursts, then you would see discontinuity in the interferogram. Hope that's clear. Yeah, so this is, um, say if you are used to, some of you have been doing processing with uh, GMTSAR. GMTSAR typically, I don't know if that has changed, but it used to not do ESD. Is that still true? Yeah, that is true. And as as I, I don't know if you were there, Franz, yesterday, um, I mentioned that actually, um, you know, we, we got into ESD at the very beginning that even ESA uh, thought that's a big deal, really. That's a big problem with TOPS. But it showed us in the last four or five years that it's not a really a big problem. Uh, personally, I suggest the geometrical co-registration is, is good enough, especially that also we understood that there are a lot of other things that are causing the um, uh, azimuth misregistration, which is not specifically a constant time shift. As you know, you know, ionosphere or even the some problems with the data processing itself. 
um, ESA has um, is still using the old approach of the range Doppler focusing in blocks for tops, which is not really the best way to process the tops data. There is, there is not technically there is not enough uh, functionality there to take care of the extra Doppler. So there is some some problems with the FM rates, and uh, that leads to some of these issues. So basically, yeah, I agree. Probably uh, just using the geometrical co-registration is fine in many cases. And I I was as I said yesterday, I was hesitant to keep that part in the notebook or not. But since the spectral diversity and um, the this this uh, double difference interferograms have additional values that people have started exploring for, um, for azimuth shifts, for north-south displacement, basically. Then I, I, I decided to keep it um, to encourage um, maybe some of you to, to dig into more details. Yeah, so you may see if you don't do it, you may see in places that you have slight um, phase jumps from one verse to the next. Uh, you have linear phase discontinuities. Um, those you try. Uh, um, those come from slight misalignments uh, between the images, um, and that's what you're trying to fix. Um, it, it, ESD makes that most of these um, phase discontinuities go away, but not always in all cases. Uh, it depends a bit on coherence and, uh, and sometimes other those, effects that have, uh, happen. In the yeah, image. sometimes it's real deformation that causes those phase yes. jumps. Uh, because because of the difference in line of the squint angle on either side of the, the burst boundary, uh, if there's a north-south displacement, uh, you can resolve a small phase change. Yeah, there was a concern when when the tops mode came out uh, that this may cause some issues in things like phase unwrapping. And, and, uh, but overall, it, it turned out that it wasn't as big of an issue as we initially were concerned about. It's still useful to do it, uh, especially if you operationally process larger volumes of data to have consistent data quality throughout. There is another question from Jay Kim. Can you share your screen like um, others so we could see what's the problem exactly? Because it's not clear for me. Okay. Just a frame. So I tried to obtain rigid crest co-seismic signal. It seems the epicenter is a little bit off the... Yeah, so so uh, this looks like still one subswat. If you go up, the easiest easiest thing would be uh, just in your tops app.xml, um, either manually change it, or if you scroll down a little bit where yeah, you could do it here as well, yeah. where you are comfortable. Uh, where is your tops app.xml? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so you see the subswat three, yes. make it one comma two comma three. And you don't need the, so basically all three subswats are gonna be processed. And the region of interest, uh, um, uh, is it, are you confident about region of interest? Yes, I checked the epicenter and that covers the entire okay. map. So that's why, well, I thank you very much. Yeah, sure. And a, a VI user, I like it. questions so may I ask my question right now I, I could access my other device uh, so as I said my problem is again about that connecting um, to the um, alaska.edu website to download data and I guess if I can solve this problem then I would be able to download those ALOS data as well that you talked about on Monday um so can i share my screen with you just to show thank you sure so uh, when i try to do this 
uh, I give this L. So um, it seems that I should um, change the settings of net RC file. Um, so um, as you suggested, I went to this website to see how I can do it. Uh, but um, you see here, it says to go to application and to authorize it. Uh, do you still have my share? I'm oh, sorry. We lost, we lost yeah, this. Yeah, sorry. I think. Um, okay. So it said that I should have uh, this application and then authorize it. But when I go to mine, I do not see that application. It just says about this agreement. And when I um, sign this agreement, um, I, it, it still, asks me to download something. You still have to click, click agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree that this on this one. So this file is downloaded and then I don't know what to do next. So you downloaded this this file now to your local machine? Yeah, I downloaded this one. Well, it's it's just the Earth Data stuff, um, um, right? So if you click Agree, you say something is downloaded. Yeah, and if I click on. Agree, uh, this one is becoming downloaded. Okay. Um, but when I click on it, uh, it asks me to open it, and I don't know. You don't what? have to open it, but, but if, if, if the download works, that means your, your account works. Uh -huh. so the next step is then you have to put your login credentials into that net.netrc file so that um, it will work automatically on OSL when you, when you try and do these download things. Right, so the, the file you downloaded is really not relevant. It's just to test whether your login uh -huh. or your credentials are valid. Okay. And it looks like they are. Uh, so now you can go back to the open SAR lab. Uh, now that we know that your username and password works and you have all the necessary you mean apps you? authorized. Yes. Okay. So would you please tell me where I should put my username and password? Can you, can you go to the main page of the open SAR lab? Yeah. Um, if you go to the few tabs earlier in your browser. The geo sync where you want. Yeah, That's this one. one. Yeah. Can you do new, new terminal? Uh, Click on new, yeah. Terminal. Terminal. Uh -huh. And oh, do an okay. ls minus a. A space oh, minus a. Sorry. Okay. Minus a, like in, in Apple. Oh, yeah. yeah. And should I Yes. Enter, yes. So you don't okay. have a net RC set up. Um, so how can I do that? I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I copied the link in the chat. I'll do it again to the latest. Thank there, you. Is a, there is a step one in that link. You have to follow the step one in that link with your own user and pass. Yeah, if you click on that link, Yeah, go to step one. Yeah. yeah, you see there is one one comment. Actually two of them. So echo uh, exactly the same thing. You just need to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, just you have to put in your um, uh, user and password instead of UID and password, okay. you see. So I should, I mean, I should copy and paste these ones as- Yeah, um, yeah in the as, terminal. Yeah, yeah the in terminal the terminal that you just, yes. And okay. replace where it says your know, username and password or UID and password with your username and password. Okay, okay. And so once, would... once you did that, the next step would be that CH mode 0600. So basically the first one creates the .netrc file, which you don't have right now, as Franz told you, you did, ls dash a you didn't have that file yeah so the first one is going to create that file and uh inside it there will be your username and password 
And then uh, once you have that, just run the next comment, chmod and the rest, and you should be good to go. Okay, thank you. So I'll try that. Yes. Thanks. Excellent. <clears throat> see, uh, Jay Kim, that's already answered, I think. Yeah, maybe, Jesse, you're right. Uh, so you may see if it doesn't work right away, uh, you may have to put um, a carriage return um, in your NetRC file to have the username and password in different lines. Um, that may be needed uh, to make it work, but you can try it the way it's in the in the uh, in the instructions first and see if you can make it work out. Other questions? Let's see what time it is. We have ten more minutes. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Oh, before the, before the break, there's one question about the interpretation of the top sap exercise results. Do you have anything uh, to share? Yes, I may share my screen just quickly. And. Okay, um, I selected an area over the um, over Amatrice. There was an earthquake in 2016, um, and so I believe I got uh, the place where uh, where the uh, and and the time where where the earthquake took place. Um, I have a question here. I believe here I see the fringes related to the earthquakes, but I see many more fringes here. Is this atmosphere or? Yeah. Okay, yeah, this most likely is atmosphere. atmosphere. Okay, yeah, right by the ocean, oh, no, the, the, the sea. So, yeah, so there's a lot of water vapor, and it, yeah, okay, okay. And then, um, I just it got was the, the result, summer, right? The it was an dropping. August earthquake, it was five years ago, uh, it was August, yeah, yeah. So, that's that's in, it's hot, the one in Italy, hot right? humid. It's sorry, in Italy. it's in, in it's Italy, Italy. Right? yes, yeah. It's in Italy, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a very difficult one to see in Sivan. <laughs> okay, I, I got the one. <laughs> um, just just a question. I mean, just to how should I interpret then also the unwrap? So here on the sea, I don't understand why I get something like this. I would expect something more uncoherent, not just something right. like a ramp. The magic. Yeah. Of so the. The data set is originally incoherent, uh, but then uh, the unwrapping is going to try to, you know, unwrap that space anyway. So uh, what okay. you come up with is a little bit arbitrary. Yes. Yeah, just go okay. down, go down, scroll down. Yeah, yeah. I see that here down. there is a complete yeah. Yeah. Uh, separation. So yeah. The first thing I... you do, the first thing mm -hmm. you do, you mask out your unwrapped interferogram with whatever is zero in connected components. So you see the ocean is zero. So automatically you get rid of that part of the ocean yeah. and the area around your frame that there is no data is also zero so yeah also inside you see where the earthquake is it's very tricky to unwrap that because what you showed was really uh, noisy and the displacement probably is large so the correlation all those things and there are multiple connected components there and partly even there was not it was not possible to unwrap so yeah, another good example that take a look at your connected component, mask out zeros, be careful with the rest. There might be discontinuity between different regions. Region, I mean, all those different colors. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's interesting. Just, uh, just one more word about the connected region. So um, about the number. So I can understand a different region here at the border that will be uh, some uh, some let's say phase jump that doesn't allow the unwrapping, so these two region uh, will not be processed together. Uh, but the, what what does it mean the number actually of connected region? So it's like that oh, from uh... yeah. So so zero means you cannot trust, right? There okay. is no guarantee that Snafu actually doesn't solve for the zero. 
basically. Mm -hmm. At the end, it 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 produces uh, an unwrapped phase. But yeah, it's very clear that that part sh should just be masked out. Okay, so zero, no trust in zero. Then from one and up, the region number numbering stops. One is the largest connected component. So the in in most cases, in probably more than 99% of the cases that we have seen so far, and that's really we did some statistics in June that recently, uh, the connected components can be trusted uh, in such a way that all the phase unwrapped phase within connect within a given connected component, let's say connected component one, which is the blue here, the light blue. Uh, the phase within that region probably is unwrapped, most likely unwrapped properly. So you can trust that. But then uh, you have all other regions too, which then as you go up with the numbers, the size of the region or connected component gets smaller. And uh, then basically the phase within each region most likely is unwrapped properly, but there might be discontinuity between region to region. So that, that part, we have the two-stage unwrapping if your ice two two-stage unwrapping is working. Um, there, is a, there is an attempt to solve the two pi integer numbers between the different regions, or you could do it in post-processing. MintPy has some, some ways to do it, um, but yeah. Is that is that clear now? Yeah, yeah, it's much clearer. Is this an output of Snafu, or yeah, uh... it is, this okay. is Snafu? Yes. And if you okay, go perfect. up, if you go up one more time, we are out of time. No, we have time actually. Uh, if you look at the wrapped interprogram, the wrapped interprogram. Um, yeah. So I would I would suggest to play a little bit with the multi looking the fringes in uh, where you have the the earthquake. I remember this earthquake, this earthquake was very tricky to get the proper fringes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you have to really play a little bit more with the number of logs, maybe use less number of logs and filter differently, stronger filters. Yeah, I don't know, but it's not very easy. And in this case, I don't see very clear fringes where the earthquake is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so the connected component plot is basically just a patch numbering scheme. It's all into integers, so the largest patch gets the number one, the second largest patch, number two, and so on. And if it goes all the way in your case, it went to like, I don't know, 17 or so. It means you have 17 different connected components. Okay, thanks. And there is a question, Caleb. How would one go about masking portions with zero connected components? Well, you have two arrays. That's not about ice, really. It's your NumPy um, playing with NumPy arrays, right? So you have two arrays. One has uh, your unwrapped interprogram, and the other one has uh, some, uh, let's say, zero and one. And you just want to say whatever in the other one is zero, just mask out in this one. And we should take a break now so we can get uh, the next segment relatively on time. Yes, let's do, uh, should we do a five minute break? Uh, do you mind starting five minutes late, Brent, so we can get a 10 minute break? Oh, that's perfectly fine with me. All right, so let's take 10 minutes and start at 11.05. Okay, thanks for all the questions. See you in 10 minutes.
We get going. Yep. All right. I'd like to welcome Brent Minchu, professor at MIT. Um, he's been very, very busy, but has put together a very compelling presentation for us. And uh, we're going to have also another module on offsets uh, tomorrow presented by Brian Real, who works with Brent. So without further ado, Brent, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm going to, I just threw together some slides for this. Uh, they pretty much track the Jupyter notebook that is on OpenSAR Lab. So if y'all want to follow along with that, that's good. I will share my screen to work off of the slides. This is the format I'm more used to. Let me uh, change out. Okay. You should see the slide, some glaciers in the background. Looks good. Yep. All good. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. And uh, it's it's good to see so many people actually in uh, in this INSAR workshop. It was exciting uh, for the future of the field. Lots of people learning INSAR uh, for, I'm sure, for a variety of applications. So you're going to get a different flavor of discussion, I think, in um, in this lecture that I give. Uh, from all of the others that you've received in the sense that it's going to be less technical on the INSAR side and much more focused on interpretation of INSAR. So conceptual, uh, the concepts that we use and thinking about how to infer uh, various physical properties and so forth from INSAR. So that's pretty much where my research sits and that of my research group sits and is in using large amounts of INSAR and other remote sensing data together to try to make inferences of various physical properties, particularly as related to glacier flow, ice sheet evolution, and so forth. So I'm gonna try to tie all these things together, uh, try to connect everything and ground it. And some of the concepts that you've been learning so far uh, that Gareth has taught and teaching about the solid earth and then the technical aspects of INSAR. So we'll see where this goes. So anyhow, uh, overview and objectives of this, of this lecture. Uh, the main objective is gonna be to provide a general introduction into the ways in which uh, INSAR can be applied to the study of glaciers. So we're going to go over a brief introduction to glaciers. We're going to talk about some fundamental modes of glacier flow, their distinction from solid earth deformation uh, that Gareth talked about um, previously, 
And we're gonna talk about how to relate uh, INSAR observations to these fundamental modes of glacier flow so that we can infer the properties that we want to infer from the observations that we can make. We're gonna go over the relationships between observed surface velocity and velocity to other depths. We're gonna go over different drivers of vertical displacement um, that exist in the natural systems. And then, well, we're not gonna quite get to this, but in the Jupiter notebook, uh, there's some uh, discussions about uh, various noise sources common noise sources related to glaciers uh, and how these can create some interesting uh, applications and challenges uh, when using uh, INSAR observations to study glacier flow. So glaciers, rivers of ice, a transport mass that's gained through snowfall at higher elevation uh, to areas of mass loss at lower elevation. And so we're accumulating mass at the top, everything's flowing down under the weight of gravity. Uh, mass loss occurs down here in what's called the ablation zone, either by melting off the surface, melting off of the base of the ice when it comes into contact with oceans and lakes, or calving of icebergs off the front. A little bit of mass is lost through sublimation, but that doesn't end up being terribly important in the overall scheme of mass loss. So glaciology being the study of glaciers, we've broken down along many different lines. Uh, some examples include the study of surface mass balance, that is rates of snowfall, wind speeds, melt, so on and so forth, uh, and then glacier dynamics. Glacier dynamics is what I do. So INSAR is most commonly used to study glacier dynamics, but it can have other uses. In particular, uh, some work has been done in the past um, by Howard Zebker and his group in particular, at looking at estimating snow accumulation rates on glaciers uh, using INSAR correlation. So I think Weber Cohen did some of that work, and if you're interested in it, uh, feel free to look it up and dig into that. A basic takeaway from this is that I would argue that INSAR isn't used to its fullest potential in glaciology just yet. Most of the applications are focused on glacier dynamics, and that's the thing that we're going to talk about here today. So brief history on this, just because I think this kind of thing is fun. Uh, so since the 1990s, INSAR has proven to be an invaluable tool in understanding glaciers and ice sheets, how they respond to climate change and other environmental forces. So I put this historic piece of literature here on the uh, on the portal. I'm sure that Paul remembers this. I think he's old enough to remember that. Uh, this is from um, a paper from Goldstein and others published in 1993. Uh, it's published in Science, and I do believe this is one of the first interferograms uh, that's published in the literature. Certainly, I believe that one of the first interferograms of glacier flow in the literature. And this is kind of nice to me as well, because this area is near and dear to my heart, as we're going to go over uh, in a little bit. But basically, you see an interferogram, uh, like the kind of things that you've worked with so far. So you'll see the wrapping, the fringe rates. This is all done with ERS, so C-band radar. You see high fringe rates in some areas, and we're going to talk about why that occurs uh, in a little bit. Areas of what appear to be noise uh, along these various strips, these things that are labeled marginal shear zones and so forth and then a number of different densities of fringes uh, around this image. We're gonna kind of break down this image a little bit uh, as we go along in this lecture, give you an idea of what all pieces of the puzzle uh, you are seeing in all this. So in the early days, INSAR was limited to one or a few snapshots in a handful of areas like Rutford Ice Stream that we just showed in this particular image. But after several years of research, data collection, lots of satellites and so forth, a more complete view of the spatial variability of, of ice flow in Greenland, Antarctica, and other glaciers around the world started to emerge. So this is the first, on the left-hand side, the first continent-wide map that we have of Antarctic flows cobbled together from pretty much all of the NSTAR data that was available at the time. It's about 20 years worth of data at that time, all kind of stitched together to give us this general view of flow in Antarctica, where we have these relatively fast flowing areas as indicated on the color map here that are concentrated in these streaming features. And then they tend to flow toward these larger areas of relatively fast flow. These are the floating ice shelves, the floating extensions of the ice sheet. And this is where pretty much all mass loss uh, in Antarctica occurs. So in a nutshell, snowflake that falls anywhere in Antarctica is eventually compressed into glacier ice, flows through one of these fast flowing glaciers and ice streams and is lost to the ocean and the ice shelf, either by melting off the base or calving off the front. So INSAR has proven invaluable in mapping these flow fields as well as locating the point at which the ice starts to go afloat. That's an area that's called the grounding line. We're gonna get back to that in a little bit. So delineating the difference between the floating ice and the grounded ice and helping us dig in to understand these various patterns of flow by some areas are flowing faster than others. What are the consequences of that? 
What are the processes that give rise to that? Similarly, on the right-hand side, that's a figure I stole from one of Ian Jockin's papers. Uh, so Ian has done a lot of work also stitching together lots of NSAR observations to give this give us this kind of complete view of flow in Greenland. Very different features in flow in Greenland versus Antarctica. To a good approximation, Greenland is kind of topographically controlled. So you have a lot of glaciers flowing through mountain ranges and so forth. At the edge, the fast flowing regions are kind of concentrated near the edge of the Greenland ice sheet. There's one ice stream up here in the Northeast uh, called the Northeast Greenland Ice Stream uh, that extends relatively deep into the system. But, and as a general rule, kind of flow properties in, in Greenland are a bit different than the flow properties in Antarctica. And there's a general lack of floating ice shelves and so forth in Antarctica. Or sorry, general lack of floating ice shelves in Greenland, lots of floating ice shelves in Antarctica. These are all things that were sorted out primarily with the use uh, of NSAR. So you're all here to learn NSAR though. Presumably most of you are starting out your career as scientists and practitioners of NSAR and so forth. So I wanted to make a brief note, kind of look into the future of NSAR uh, for glaciers. So at, at this point in time, we have a pretty good understanding of the spatial variability in ice flow, through the work, largely through the work that I just showed you. So virtually all, lar all major kind of large scale that is 100 meters or so and persistent features of ice flow have been mapped up to this point. So there's not a lot left to do in terms of spatial coverage of NSAR observations within the cryosphere. Everything now kind of boils down to thinking about time variability, and then in some cases getting better spatial resolution in a few areas that are of interest. Now the time domain is, I think, the, the most interesting and exciting area of research. It's really not well understood, basically due to this historical lack of data. So I showed the map that Eric Rigno formed earlier in 2011. That was 20 years worth of data all piled together to make that single average velocity field. And we've gotten more and more data now, but we're still kind of to the point where we're usually happy if we can resolve the changes in glacier velocity at kind of monthly to annual time scales. But there are a lot of many shorter time scales that give us a lot of good keys into what's going on. Uh, ways in which we can probe the dynamics of the system to better understand the mechanics that allow for the flow that have not been uh, explored in any meaningful way, simply because we haven't had the data or the people to do that kind of analysis. So if you're sitting in this class and you're learning in SAR and you're excited about glacier dynamics, I would strongly encourage you to start thinking about how you can extend uh, efforts into the time domain and how you can infer time variation uh, in glacier flow using stacks of NSAR observations or offset fields. And Brian Reel, uh, my colleague, uh, a longtime colleague, uh, is going to give a lecture on that uh, tomorrow and kind of get you started looking at pieces of how to form offset fields and how to work with stacks of offset fields that are collected at different points in time. So all of the research, all of doing this kind of research, um, delving into the time domain and so forth is just going to benefit from extensive data archives as new instruments, new time series tools uh, are developed and put forward a lot of the things that you're learning about in this course. So some recent examples of this work, we'll take the liberty of emphasizing uh, our own work within the field. This is some stuff that we published uh, a few years ago now. It feels like ancient history, um, but it was I think one of the first uh, time dependent velocity fields that we got of an entire ice stream. So going back to Rutford Ice Stream, which is the original image that I showed um, in the Goldstein paper, that area of interest is actually located right around in here. So what we're looking at in this movie, though, as we play things forward, and what we're interested in is looking at the tidal variability of ice flow in this particular area. So we got a whole bunch of data uh, collected from Cosmos Sky Med, which is a four satellite constellation that's operated by the Italian Space Agency. So uh, Ozzy collected data for us for eight continuous months, every single acquisition that they could get, over 39 unique flight tracks. So we had all these ascending and descending pairs that were stacked up that covered this entire area. So we did offset field tracking on all these things, ended up with something like 1,500 uh, offset fields that we can work with that were collected over this eight-month period. We stacked all these things together, and then we inferred uh, the sinusoidal variations in the horizontal flow, which is what we're showing here, as well as the vertical motion of the floating ice shelf due to the ocean tides that we'll get to in a little bit. So this is the result of that. Uh, what, what we're showing here is the total velocity field and how it changes in time. And on the right-hand side is variations uh, in the velocity, all done 
uh, with offset fields uh, that Brian's going to talk about uh, later. What we're showing along here on the bottom is a simple tidal model that just gives you a sense of kind of where we are in the tidal cycle. You'll see this general beat cycle, this low frequency cycle here. This is the spring neap tides. It all has to do with the alignment of the Earth, Moon, and the Sun. Uh, and it basically comes down to a period of half the, uh, the period of the Moon, so 14.77 days or so. That's the primary variability of the horizontal flow on Rutherford. So what we think is happening here is that the ice shelf is going up and down. It's changing. Uh, what we call the buttressing stresses or the resistive stresses that are provided by the ice shelf. As those resistive stresses change, the flow of the ice uh, is, is enabled or is resisted, and the velocity of the glacier changes by about 20% or so over this two-week, this fortnightly time period. And so on the right-hand side, we're seeing these variabilities. We see them change over the ice shelf, and then we watch these variabilities as we propagate into the grounded ice sheet itself. And that rate of propagation, the rate of attenuation of that propagation tells us a ton about the connection between the glacier and the solid earth, how the ice deforms, and so on and so forth. Again, all done from SAR observations. Similar kind of thing that we published earlier this year. Uh, so this is a new deal in the last one. We had to take advantage of the fact that uh, we knew that the variability was sinusoidal in the velocities, and so we could stack up all of our observations and just infer the amplitude and the phase of a few uh, components. In this case, we've extended those time series methods, and Brian's going to talk about a little bit tomorrow to include more general variations in time. So in this case, what we're looking at is seasonal variations on Jakobshav and Isbre, uh, also known as Cermak Huzlek which is located here uh, in West Greenland. It's one of the fastest outlet glaciers in the world. So it's not shown in the video that the, the terminus position on this thing is changing, but it is changing over time, and that's causing the overall surface velocity of the glacier to respond. So we get to peak velocities during relatively warm years of 2012, 2013, 2014, and so forth. But what we're really interested in thinking about research is how this signal propagates through. So SAR ends up being uh, the, the best tool that we have for this. Again, this is done with a big stack of offset fields, but what it does, it gives us the ability to resolve the spatial temporal variability in the glacier flow. So as the terminus position retreats, as surface melt makes it to the bed and lubricates the base of the glacier, the glacier can accelerate. And we're really interested in how that acceleration moves through the system. That is the phase velocity and the decay length scale of the waves that are carrying the signal through the glacier, because these things give us unique insight again into the mechanics of ice flow, the kind of things that we really want to be able to infer from stuff. And final example of this, because I love movies and hopefully you all like movies as well. Uh, this is some new stuff that we're doing, still working on in prep. We're looking at the response of, this is Pine Island Glacier, so a major outlet glacier in West Antarctica that is one of the major sources of, of sea level rise from you know, the Antarctic continent. So here we're interested in the, how the flow of Pine Island Glacier changes in response to the ongoing disintegration of its floating ice shelf. So the ice shelf is shown in this area that's downstream of this black line. This black line is the grounding line, something that was found from looking at NSAR observations that we're going to talk about here in just a second. But what's interesting on the left-hand side and a, little, and a bit you can see on the right-hand side are these star amplitude images in the background. So you can see these large chunks of ice as they're breaking off. You can see in these colored contours changes in the velocity field. You can watch the velocity field localize in these areas because what's happening is that this margin over here that was resisting ice flow is disintegrating. As that margin disintegrates, these large icebergs break off. You can see the rifts forming in, these, uh, in this ice. You can see those rifts as they propagate across to this other margin. And then you can see over here, what we're plotting is the relative velocity field, all taken from SAR offset fields. And you can see the glacier accelerate. You can watch this acceleration as it's coming up in this large calving event, moves across as that block goes. And then you see the acceleration as it starts in this margin, as the ice is disconnected from this area. And you can watch this signal as it propagates upstream, it moves from the floating ice to the grounded ice. And understanding how that signal makes that transition from floating ice to grounded ice, and how it moves quickly, how it damps out, and so forth, is really key to our understanding of 
how the ice is coupled to the solid earth, what the proper rheology is, and really at the end of the day, how to properly model all these things and represent it in projections of sea level rise. Okay, so with time dependent observations, uh, movies are fun, but when we get down to business, uh, we think about the kind of things that we can track and observe. Uh, we can observe waves propagating through glaciers, something people have been after for a long time. We're finally able to do it. We're just starting to be able to do it because we have the data available to us. And you all, as you move forward uh, and progress in your scientific career, you have more and more data available to you, more and more opportunities to do this kind of work, to track waves, to really think about the spatial and temporal variability, move beyond looking at snapshots, which is all people were able to do in the past. We can also look, look at localized deformation associated with ice fracturing. So you just saw in the last movie, the fractures that were forming, you can see these things in the SAR amplitude images and we can pick them up in the offset fields as well. And if we take the offset fields, we form them into velocity fields. We take the gradient of that, that tells us about the strain rate, the deformation rate of the material, which is directly relatable to the stresses. And that's the thing that we care about because we wanna understand under what stress conditions ice fractures. Under what stress conditions do these rifts break off, start to drive the flow of ice? Because this is one of the essential features for better understanding how glaciers and ice sheets are going to evolve uh, as the climate changes. We can look at and we can understand the ephemeral grounding of the floating ice shelves. So that map of the grounding line we talked about before, that's picked out uh, from INSAR observations, as we'll talk about in a bit. It's basically looking at the change in the vertical displacement um, that's picked up by INSAR over the floating ice shelves. And finally, we can look at spatial variability, uh, spatially varying amplitudes of the ocean tides under floating ice. The first example that I showed you, we were able to do that kind of thing. We actually made uh, one, of, one of the first ma sort of maps of what the ocean tidal amplitude and phase looks, at, looks like under these areas. And we did it all uh, with time series of SAR observations. And there's so much more we can do, so much more stuff that I've never thought of, that anybody else has ever thought of. And so if you come at this, learn the technical skills in this class, throw a creative mind to it, you'll do amazing things. So time dependence, again, I can't stress this enough, is really the new frontier of research in INSAR and other remote sensing observations, particularly as it pertains to glaciology. And there's loads of work to do, loads of opportunities to make fundamental contributions. So since Gareth talked somewhat uh, in a previous class about thinking about solid earth, and, the, and modeling uh, INSAR observations uh, they collected over the solid earth, I wanted to try to give you a brief connection uh, between glaciers and the solid earth. So when you're thinking about glacier flow connected to something that you've learned already. So we'll start off with some basics. Uh, so I'm assuming that not everybody is an expert uh, in continuum mechanics when it comes to this class. If you are, apologies for boring you on this. Uh, but from a mechanics perspective, solid earth, is a solid. Solids are defined as things that can support shear stresses for relatively long periods of time. And glacier ice is a fluid, and fluids are defined as materials that deform continuously under applied shear stresses. And just make a brief note here that we use fluid and solid here to describe the mechanical properties of materials and not the states of matter. So liquids, is a description of the state of matter. Liquids are fluids, but fluids are not necessarily liquids. Fluids can be things that are in any state of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma. So ice is a polycrystalline solid, here using solid to describe the state of matter, and it flows as a viscous fluid over time scales that are observable with INSAR, which is to say that over time scales longer than about a day, maybe a week, in some cases where the ice is really cold, the ice is a viscous fluid, and it flows just as a viscous fluid, just like syrup or honey spreading across the plate. Now, the deformation and the flow of ice is facilitated by the motion of voids and dislocations. You might think of these as imperfections uh, at, the, uh, at the molecular scale in the material. And these, these voids and dislocations are able to move within and between individual ice crystals. Two primary modes of deformation that we'll talk about here today. There are others, but these are just the basic ones. Diffusion creep, which is the motion of void spaces within the crystalline lattice. These void spaces move or they diffuse uh, through the crystalline lattice in response to applied stress. So the material relaxes as these void spaces move through. All materials have void spaces. 
you cannot have a material, particularly one in steady state that has no void spaces. It's not energetically favorable to do that. It's most energetically favorable to have at least some void spaces in the material. And then the, those allow the material uh, to deform fairly readily. In addition to that, ice, polycrystalline material, lots of water molecules, just H's and O's, they're all connected together. Individual water molecules are connected into the crystalline structure of the ice through hydrogen bonding and so forth. Those connections are imperfect. You put all of these things together and there will be what we call dislocations, places where there maybe should be a bond, but that bond is not able to be connected. So as the material is sheared, that dislocation, that connection moves through the material and the actual structure kind of moves in a stepwise fashion. The analogy of this is if you wanted to try to pull a rug across the floor, it would be really hard to pull the entire rug. Instead, you can make a wrinkle in the rug and then you can move that wrinkle all the way down and you can move the rug in fairly short order. Materials like ice move in the same kind of way. Imperfections, those imperfections allow for localization of stresses that mobilize individual um, pieces and connections at, at the molecular scale, allow the material to deform. Whew, should really pick it up. Uh, just a brief side note, this is the kind of stuff that I love. So obviously we're spending a lot of more time on it than maybe we should have. But maybe the fun part about all this and thinking about the answer observations is, the, is that the, this dependence of ice flow and creep mechanisms means that we can use INSAR observations that are collected from satellites to infer the motion of water molecules that are going on in the ice. And I think that that's awesome. That's like 15 orders of magnitude uh, in terms of spatial scale separation, which I think is absolutely epic. And one of the funnest things about doing this kind of remote sensing work and looking at how glaciers in particular flow and deform in the earth. But to make these kind of inferences, to really sort of get at what's going on, we have to understand the connections between what we observe and what we want to know. Now we can describe the flow deformation and fracture of materials uh, in a variety of ways, but basically two main ways that we describe them. We can describe them in terms of motion. This is referred to as a kinematic description, and we can describe them in terms of forces that drive that motion. That's a dynamical description. INSAR gives us kinematic quantities and we often want to relate these kinematic quantities to the dynamics, so the forces that are driving the motion and the processes that allow it. So solids versus fluids, usually we're interested in different but related kinematic INSAR observations because the dynamical descriptions differ. In solids, what we often care about is looking at the displacement and the deformation, deformation being the, the gradient of displacement, which is related to strain, which is most simply defined in its uniaxial sense as the change in length over the total length of something like a bar. So if I took my pen, I stretch it out, the change in length of that pen over the original length is strain. And an idealized, at least linear elastic material, uh, stress is proportional to the strain. So what we're interested in observing are these deformation fields, the gradients of displacement and so forth, uh, and, and in order to get a better understanding of the overall stress field. In fluids, at least an ideal fluid, Strain doesn't matter at all. We don't care about strain. What we care about is the rate of deformation, which is sometimes called the strain rate. So we're most interested in using INSAR observations to get at uh, velocities and the gradients of velocities, because it's the gradients of velocities, uh, also called strain rate, that are directly relatable to stress. And in material like ice, there's a nonlinear relationship between the stress and the strain rate that we can observe. These are often related in power law form where we get an exponent uh, in that ranges typically somewhere between two and five. And this value of n and the changes in the value of n really have important implications uh, for NSAR observations of glacier flow. So to dig into this a little bit more, strain rate scales as stress raised to the n value. So n is the exponent uh, on the stress of the self. And because of this, we can relate then the viscosity of the ice to the stress, which is viscosity scales as stress raised to the one minus n power. And so any changes in the value of n then has a major influence on the local viscosity of the ice, which in turn then has a major influence on the deformation and the NSAR observations that you make. So just kind of hammer this down in the things that you know, n equals one is a Newtonian fluid. That simply means that the viscosity is independent of stress. So liquid water is a Newtonian fluid. 
the glacier ice, like we mentioned before, it has values of n somewhere between two and five. Although I'll just point out that it's calibrating the value of n is very much an active very research that NSAR can contribute directly to. So with the values of n greater than one, we can plug this in and we can say we get a negative exponent value uh, on stress. And what that means is that viscosity decreases as stress increases. So as we increase stress, viscosity decreases, that softens the ice, that localizes the deformation. And that makes NSAR observations in many ways more interesting. We get higher fringe rates in these areas. We have, we have sometimes a harder time unwrapping these things. So the dependence on viscosity and stress is, is really a thing that, that, that we get excited about. I certainly get very excited about. But the obvious question is what sort of determines this value then? And the short answer is the creep mechanisms um, that we discussed previously. So diffusion creep will get n equals one. So we get Newtonian fluid, which is kind of boring. But pretty much everywhere in ice, or at least everywhere in ice on Earth under terrestrial conditions, we'll typically see a significant contribution of dislocation creep that we talked about before, this, this motion of carpet uh, across the floor. Dislocation creep requires n values typically of three or more, probably in the four range, but we're still working on this kind of thing. Now that all assumes that the ice lattice is still relatively intact, but if we get a lot of damage going on, the disintegration that we saw in pig before and so forth, we get plastic deformation in the ice or failure of the ice, and this sort of thing can result in a very large value of n. In fact, n will go to infinity for a perfect failure, a rifting uh, of the ice itself and a sliding of two blocks uh, relative to one another. And so this kind of thing basically ends up looking like uh, an earthquake. Uh, so faulting that you see in the NSAR observations you saw before. Uh, the creep mechanisms have the less interesting values of N. They're closer to one. So this value of N really creates these interesting challenges and opportunities for NSAR observations. And we're going to dive into how that works uh, now. So thinking about the fundamental modes of glacier flow uh, and how we relate these kind of things to observations. Um, we can step back and kind of justify the things that we're doing by uh, thinking about two basic facts. Uh, that drive a lot of work in geophysics and other scientific fields. And something worth keeping in mind when thinking about NSAR observations. First is that we can only observe a small subset of the things that we want to know. And the second is that observations are facts. When scientific pro science progresses through the development of organizing principles that make sense of these facts, right? And so then the basic questions are then how do we relate the things that we can observe to the things that we want to know? And how do we organize and interpret the observations that we want to make? That's sort of the gist of what we're talking about today. So in general, it's through inference using observations to test and constrain models. With NSAR, we can measure glacier flow velocity at the very near surface. So there's going to be some non-zero penetration depth of the radar, but for the most part, we are measuring the velocity of the surface of the glacier itself. But often, we want to know how the ice velocity varies with depth. So how fast is the glacier actually slipping along its bed. And that's not something that we're currently able to measure directly, certainly not using NSAR. So when we think about this kind of thing and we think about the relationship between what we can observe and what we often want to know, we can think about two N-member models uh, for glacier flow and how that glacier flow varies as a function of depth. There's a vertical shear dominated flow, and this is basically ice that's frozen to the bed. And as it's flowing along, everything's just deforming and you get this gradient of deformation near the bed that tends to taper off. And the slope of this deformation and this overall shape and the tendency for it to taper off is all a function of this exponent n that we were talking about before. In fact, then the surface velocity uh, simply scales as the ice thickness raised to this n plus one power. And then in the most extreme case, the n member case, this velocity at the bed itself is equal to zero. The opposite end member case is when the surface velocity is equal to the velocity of the bed. And then this kind of thing depends less on the overall thickness of the ice, and it depends more on the width of the glacier, the kind of thing that we can actually observe. So it ends up scaling as width to the n plus one. And again, this kind of shape is driven by this value of n, so the kind of thing that we can really start to pick apart when using NSAR observations. Now, which one of these flow regimes best represents your area of interest is likely to have a major influence uh, on your inference of your NSAR results. So if you're sitting in this class and you're thinking about using NSAR for glacier observations, just keep in mind this type of variability. It's common to simply assume one or the other within the field, 
but it's good to keep in mind that those are assumptions very often and not necessarily things that we have a great uh, sense of or great understanding of. So we're going to focus here after though, just to get down a few more concepts um, before we get to the end of all this. Uh, on basal slip dominated flows, it's the easiest regime uh, to visualize using NSAR. Again, the velocity simply goes as the width raised to the n plus one power, and this overall shape is dominated by the uh, the value of n. So as n becomes very large, you're just localizing more deformation and so forth uh, toward the margin. So. This value of N, or the rheology of the ice overall, is going to vary according to the creep mechanisms, the temperature of the ice, and a whole host of other factors uh, that I'm happy to drone on about at length uh, for those of you who are interested. But all these things can vary in space, and they're generally sensitive to the rate of deformation itself. And the sensitivity of rheology to deformation and deformation to rheology creates this whole host of absolutely amazing feedbacks within the system that we really don't understand well at all and could definitely be studied with NSAR observations, which is a hint for, for anyone who's looking for incredibly challenging physics problems. Uh, but these feed me me mechanisms basically soften ice in areas of high deformation, which drives further concentration of deformation. Why does all this matter? For NSAR observations, it's basically that softer ice ends up giving you higher rates of deformation, which ends up being challenging uh, for doing things like unwrapping and processing of your overall, of your NSAR data. So this is just an example cross flow profile the velocity uh, of an idealized ice stream. So we have the observations um, that are focused here in the yellow lines. This is taken from the Rutford data that we showed earlier. And then a few idealized models to show you the change in the end value from five to three. So in the actual system, what we end up with are steeper gradients in the overall velocity field that is significantly higher strain rates than what we might expect from an idealized model using any of the canonical values of uh, the overall exponent. In this area, what we infer is what's happening is that the crystalline properties of the ice are changing. So ice crystals are starting to align with one another. Temperatures are going up, ice is softening, and so forth. But in this area, we kind of bumped into this when we were first processing the NSAR data, basically because we were not able to unwrap across uh, the shear margins in this area because of the fringe rate overall was just entirely too high to deal with. So hammering on that point a little bit more and going back uh, to the Goldstein data that we showed before and thinking about how this impacts the interferograms, uh, particularly the wrapped interferogram that you see in this area, this, this localization of deformation really manifests in these incredibly high strain rates. So the plot that I just showed you is a transect that goes right across the ice stream in this particular area. And so these bands that are going down here are the shear margins of the ice stream. They're lit up in the back because this interferogram is plotted over top of the amplitude images. The high strain rates create a lot of damage and the crevasses and the damaged ice and so forth like to reflect a lot of radar power back to the instrument. But you can notice that all this basically looks like noise. There's almost nothing in the way of coherent fringes across these margins because the deformation is so localized, because the deformation rate is so high. And in this case, I'm sure that they weren't able to unwrap across uh, these shear margins when we did this kind of work with Cosmos SkyMed and one day repeat with X-Band, we occasionally were able to unwrap across these margins, but for the most part, we had a really tough time. So if you're wanting to use NSAR uh, in these kind of areas, you have to be very careful uh, in your unwrapping and you have to be mindful of, I guess, the conversation that was taking place whenever I popped it in to this Zoom meeting. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, and consider complicating factors that can arise in using NSAR uh, to measure glacier flow, and namely different sources of observed vertical displacement. And this is the thing that we're going to wrap up on. So you recall, and you, I'm sure you've figured out by now, NSAR measures the displacement along the radar line of sight. Right? And so there are multiple factors that can be broadly defined as vertical displacement or vertical velocity that can then manifest and ends our observations in the line of sight displacement. So it's important to understand the differences between these things that we may consider to be vertical displacement so that you can sort out uh, what the main contribution is in these areas, correct your data as you need to in order to do the studies that you want to do. 
Four main factors of the vertical velocity associated with the flow of the ice itself. Vertical displacement due to the bulk motion of the glacier that is rising and falling. Typically, this happens over the floating ice shelves due to ocean tides. Changes in the surface elevation of the glacier and changes in radar penetration depth. We'll go over these first couple and then we'll call it a day. There's some lengthier discussion of radar penetration depth and other things in the, uh, the Jupiter notebook. So the vertical velocity due to flow. So glaciers simply accumulating snow at high elevations. It's flowing, it's melting at lower elevations as it flows downhill. In order to conserve mass, a glacier that is at or near steady state has to have a vertical velocity associated with it that maintains its thickness over time. So as snow falls, a particular parcel of ice needs to respond to that and have a downward uh, velocity within the accumulation zone that is a flow into the glacier as they're attempting to represent in these purple arrows here, uh, such that that parcel of ice moves through. That is that there's some time dependence uh, to the depth of any given parcel of ice. Similarly, in the ablation zone, where mass is lost, that same parcel is gonna move toward the surface uh, as, as, there, as the ice flows. So in INSAR, this process can manifest itself as the vertical motion of the scatter itself. The vertical velocity in general is, a very, is very small relative to the horizontal velocities and is often ignored in standard glacier uh, velocity products, but it can be of significant interest, particularly for those of us who want to do detailed observations of what's happening at the bed, the coupling of the ice and the solid earth and so forth. But it's really important to be careful of what you're inferring whenever you're inferring glacier velocity and whether or not you're actually inferring the vertical component of the velocity itself, or you're simply inferring changes in the surface elevation of the glacier. These two things should not be confused as they are different mechanisms, but they can manifest themselves in very similar ways uh, within the observations. I'm happy to talk with you at length offline about ways in which we can distinguish those two things. But we'll wrap everything up, going back to this fun image, and thinking about this rapid interferogram uh, from Goldstein and others, and looking at these areas upstream that have these relatively high fringe rates, you can see this kind of horn-like feature and so forth in these higher fringe rate areas, and then you see these lower fringe rates uh, in the surrounding areas. Now, this is labeled the grounding line here. We talked about the grounding line before. It's the thing that separates the grounded ice upstream from the floating ice downstream. So these fringes that you're observing is the vertical motion of the floating ice shelf itself in response to the ocean tides. And we can take these kind of things and we can cast them in a time series sense as we see here. Uh, these are the Cosmos SkyMet observations that we used to make the movie of tidal variability before. And you can see how this vertical motion of the tides really starts to manifest in the line of sight observations within the glacier. So all these things were taken in the same eight month period. So there's not a whole lot of time between the oldest and the newest of the observations within this link. And you can see that the observed line of sight displacement changes quite significantly between these observations. We see this horn-like pattern that's represented in the grounding line uh, that Goldstein and others had plotted out before. And this is typically the common way in which we use INSAR to map the position of this grounding line. The grounding line is kind of the, uh, a good way to take stock of the state of the ice sheet, the position of the grounding line and how it changes in time. So, a lot of work goes into thinking about how to precisely map the position of the grounding line using this tidal flexure that's picked up in the NSAR observations. So all this kind of thing just begins to barely scratch the surface on uh, using NSAR observations uh, to observe glaciers. So there's a lot more in the Jupiter notebook uh, that goes with this lecture. So in that notebook, you can read about changes in electromagnetic properties, how they influence INSAR observations. You can read about common sources of noise and error and in INSAR observations of glaciers uh, and so forth. But to just kind of wrap things up and to get us going, finishing up on time, glaciers, I would argue, are among the most exciting and challenging features of Earth that can be studied uh, with INSAR. In essence, glaciers are geological processes that are playing out over human time scale. And so what you're learning and INSAR within this UNAVCO course uh, can simply be applied to glaciers so long as you keep in mind a number of kind of unique factors uh, of observing glaciers, some interesting challenges and opportunities and so forth uh, with using INSAR and SAR observations in general. 
uh, when studying glaciers. But in essence, what we've gotten to is this point where we can start to map out these huge flow features across the entire continent of Antarctica. So this is basically a redo of the Rigno et al. map that I showed earlier. It piles a lot more data in, but really emphasizes, I think, the nature of the stream, of the streaming flow that we observe in Antarctica. And we have the map of the continental US on the back to give you the sense of scale. This amazing tool that we have, uh, MINSAR observations and remote sensing in general, to be able to visualize all these things that are going on. And now in the future, we're basically gonna take maps like this and we're gonna stack them up in the time domain. And we're gonna be able to do a lot more studies and thinking about how these features evolve and respond to things like tides, calving of icebergs and so forth. And all of that will give us these incredible windows into how these systems work, how we might expect them to evolve in the future and so forth. So what we've covered in this lecture, this is a very brief whistle stop tour, um, but we worked through the relationship between observed surface velocity uh, and the properties uh, that we may observe at depth at a very, very high level. Uh, we, we talked about a little bit about the, NSAR, the influence of ice rheology and NSAR observations, in particular the challenges of unwrapping across rapidly deformed areas like shear margins. We often get around this challenge of unwrapping and so forth or the various challenges related to NSAR because we often end up just doing offset fields, pixel tracking, speckle tracking, whatever you want to call it. And that is the, the thing that Brian is going to talk about uh, in his lecture tomorrow. He's going to walk you through some technical details about how those offset fields are made, how we put them together into a stack, how we think about um, uh, the time variation that we observe within these offset fields. Multiple mechanisms that can manifest as vertical motion and NSAR observations from flow of the ocean, to, uh, sorry, some flow of the glacier uh, to, uh, to ocean tidal uplift and changes in glacier surface elevation and so forth are all things to keep in mind uh, whenever you're making NSAR observations. So there's so much more to do with this. Um, as Paul mentioned, you know, I'm a bit on the busy side these days, so I threw together what I thought would be some a few interesting conceptual topics uh, for you all. But it's a huge uh, field, a huge area, and it's growing very fast. There are tons of opportunities uh, for NSAR specialists to contribute to glacier dynamics. So I hope some of you will at least take some interest. It's an endlessly fascinating topic. A lot of great stuff to do, a lot of fun physics to work out. So. Check out the Jupyter Notebook for more. If you're super excited about this kind of thing, uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you. So that's all I got. Great. Thank you so much, Brent. Really interesting stuff. I have about a billion questions uh, on it, but I'm going to let the students ask questions. There is a question in the chat. I'm not sure, Brent, if you see it. Oh yeah, what platform do we use to process our data? Uh, so in the past we've used ICE. Um, some of the stuff that we that we use, uh, at least in like the movies that you observe, are things that are processed uh, by other people. So there are a lot of large soft money groups out there that are processing the offset fields and then making those things available uh, to the broader community. So a lot of that stuff is processed by Ian Jockin, who I think has a lot of his, some cobbled together combination of various tools that he's collected over time. But whenever we process our data, we do it all uh, with ICE. Hopefully that's what you mean by platform. Marianne, is that your name? You have a hand up? Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, applications to glaciers um, that are in other situations. So you talked about Greenland and Antarctica, um, but have people worked on glaciers that are like in mountains or more complex topography and are there additional things you have to worry about when um, looking at things that might be at weird angles? For sure, yeah, people have looked at these things uh, kind of all over the place. Um, so yeah, whenever you're dealing with in mountains, um, of course, you have to deal with the basic um, shadowing and layover and so forth uh, that occurs whenever you're looking at SAR um, in any kind of area with high topography. Uh, but other than that, um, in terms of NSAR, I don't know of any significant geometric challenges outside of those things. Um, 
just as long as you have a reasonable DEM on the surface, you can calculate what the local incidence angle is and try to work out the relationship then between the, um, the glacier velocity vector and the line of sight vector that you're making observations along. Uh, in mountains, of course, you run into all kinds of things like surface melt, for example. There's a, there's a whole bit in the Jupiter notebook talking about the challenges associated with surface melt and using NSAR observations in areas uh, and during times in which the glacier is melting. Um, these are not issues that we run into in Antarctica. They are issues in Greenland and certainly in a lot of mountain glaciers uh, throughout the world. So does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Parvis, is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk. That was so interesting. Uh, to be honest, I <laughs> didn't think that uh, actually INSOR can have a really good results in ice and, you know, uh, snow because of uh, the noise, but these results are so amazing. I have a lot of questions, but uh, maybe just uh, ask one, one or two. Yeah, first thing, I guess, because I'm uh, mainly working on Greenland and uh, about projecting the RSL here or the glacier or other things. One of the key elements here uh, to be able to project the glacial change or uh, the change in uh, other part is that to eliminate or remove the GIA signal because uh, the recent observation contains this signal and we need to remove this to be able to interpret the actual signal. And uh, I know that there has been some studies about this region and this kind of thing to be able to reconcile the difference between the GPS observation and uh, what we see now today. So there has been a lot of problem in that case because they just assume a linear uh, geological between the solid earths. And I just wanted to know that, do you uh, uh, work on uh, removing the GA signal here or did you have any problem in that case? No, so we don't work on directly removing it um, basically because, well, one, we haven't run into this particular issue, but two, uh, what we end up doing is um, is tying the, the interferograms that we make or the offset fields that we make uh, to some you know, ground control points. And so those things are, you know, moving with, um, they have more or less the same GIA signal as anything else. And so we tie those features, subtract out uh, kind of a, a surface fit to the slow moving areas and so forth, and end up with uh, the residual that's left over, which is the high, the, the fast flowing bits. Um, that said, you know, if you were looking at we, we pretty much always focus on very fast flowing areas. You know, so like uh, Pine Island Glacier is flowing at four kilometers per year and is very focused uh, channel. Um, Jakobshavn uh, is flowing at something like 12 kilometers per year or something like that in a relatively narrow channel. And so those, those signals are so huge relative to something that you would expect uh, from GIA, which is going to be at most, you know, kind of millimeters to centimeters per year that we, we tend to not run into that in our studies as being a major source of error. But, um, you know, if you're looking at slower moving areas, it sounds like uh, you running into that challenge. I would assume that there are hopefully there's some halfway decent models on uh, um, mantle viscosity and uplift and so forth uh, from GPS observations that you could at least get kind of a first order uh, rough fit uh, to GIA. I don't know. Yeah, you see, maybe in a uh, small area that wouldn't be an issue because I saw that the Greenland Instar and just wondered that where is the reference point here because the GIA signal is too different in the whole of the region. So for Instar, we need the reference in space and in time. But for space, uh, we don't need, we don't know actually the GA signal in that area and we right. have problem to actually simulate that signal. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's one of that. And the other one is that do you uh, account for other things like basal temperature or surface heat flow to model your uh, ice flow or just you are considering the things above the solid earth? Yeah, so it depends on yeah, it depends on what kind of modeling we're doing, basically. Uh, so a lot of the modeling that we do, at least related to the NSAR stuff, is is the inverse problem. And in the inverse problem, basically what we're looking at often is things like 
inferring the drag at the base of the ice and so forth, which will be a function of um, geothermal heat flow, temperature of the bed and all this kind of thing. But it's not the, those are not processes that we need to account for within the model because they're all embedded in the inferred parameter uh, that we end up getting out. We tend to not, um, we tend to not go much beyond that in terms of trying to extract things like estimates of, of heat flow or uh, frictional heating, geothermal heating, whatever it is at the bed uh, from these inferred values, simply because we don't trust the inferred values all that much. <laughs> and then there are also uh, all kinds of complicating factors like, um, you know, the, these values of drag are going to be functions of you know, localized water pressure. They're going to be functions of roughness of the bed. They're going to be functions of a lot of things, including uh, heat flow and temperature and things of this nature. And we just don't have any way to control for the other factors uh, at, at this particular point in time. We're usually just happy to get any kind of inferences of drag that we can get. And then ideally trying to relate those inferences of drag to the observed surface velocity so that we can work out what the right basal boundary condition is uh, within models, at least when, and when I say basal boundary condition, what I mean is uh, what's typically called the sliding wall, the relationship between drag and velocity. Yeah, you're right. In, in Greenland and also uh, South Pole, the surface heat is one of the issues because we don't have any actual results and all of the models are different from each other. And uh, at the last, uh, you mentioned that there are lots of fringes in many glacier part. Have you uh, tested a larger wavelength like uh, L bands or S band? Because because of the wavelengths, you can see a uh, lower fringe that makes it even uh, easier to unwrap the face. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we you know we take what we get uh, in terms of data. It's, it's often not up to us what frequencies are are used, and so. Yeah, we're certainly happy with lower frequencies. Uh, and like when NISAR flies, um, it'll, it'll have a number of great, you know, and we're just going to collect all kinds of data and we'll probably not run into the same fringe rates. But up until now, uh, in a lot of cases, what we had available to us is X-band. And so we kind of had to live with high frequencies, even though that's not necessarily what we want. And maybe uh, it's because of the uh, penetration, because if you use a lower frequency, you, uh, your signal would penetrate much more and maybe it complicated the result as well. Yeah, I mean, we're fine with that kind of penetration. It's just mostly that um, we're not always the most important. <laughs> we're not always the, the sole consideration when people are, are designing instruments. Do we want to, Franz, I see that you unmuted. Do we want to do a few more questions in the chat or do we want to call it? Yeah, let's uh, let's maybe, there's a couple of questions that are related that talk about um, how do you get from light of sight velocity to uh, either a surface parallel flow uh, velocity or you know how are the velocities projected? There's two mm -hmm. questions uh, related to that by Quinn and by Riley, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so you can, um, yeah, so there are two different you know, options for this kind of thing. Um, in an ideal world, you would have enough diversity in line of sight views uh, to be able to simply invert for uh, the velocity vector as you have it. So that's going to require at least three unique line of sight vectors uh, and taking either INSAR observations or the offset fields uh, along those lines of sight. You can do it with ascending and descending uh, uh, orbits. On satellites, so long as you have some estimate of uh, the offsets in the in the azimuth direction, either by multi aperture interferometry or the offset fields. So Brian's going to go over that in a little bit. If you only have two line of sight or even a single line of sight, then you have to have a good um, a digital elevation model, uh, and so you can take that DEM uh, and you can calculate. Basically, you can take the assumption that the velocity vector is along the gradient to the surface. And then you can say that the, the line of sight observation that you make, the displacement along the, ra the radar line of sight is simply the dot product of um, the velocity vector, which is given to you by the DEM and um, the line of sight uh, observation that you get. And so from there, it's just a straightforward uh, geometric problem to work out how to, uh, to calculate the surface parallel component uh, of flow. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, the, the question of time, it might be, um, 
good if you uh, if we do the photograph now. Yeah, yeah, I think we need to move on. And um, take a break. Even though there's probably another dozen or two or more questions. And then Brent, maybe you can answer some of the questions in chat. Uh, yep. Typing yeah, let's take. Oh well, yeah, I got to run to a meeting in a bit, but maybe I'll pop back in and. Uh, or or on the Slack channel uh, at a later time, so people. Can... That that sounds good. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to stick around for and ruin your photo or? Yes, definitely. Please do. Okay. So who's going to coordinate this? So, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks uh, a lot, Brett, for the great lecture. Yeah. So if you could all turn your cameras on, it, maybe everybody uh, you know, mute himself, including ourselves, so that you don't jump around too much. And, yeah, and we'll I can do a... I can do the screenshot on my end. Okay. Okay. Great. I think I have two pages of people. Look at all of you. You're going to do a countdown, Melissa? Yeah, I'm not getting everybody's video just yet. <laughs> it may be a little bit of a lag. So. All right, okay. I'm gonna count to three <laughs> and I'm gonna take two pictures. So one, two, three, and one, two, Wait, there's more picture people coming in. Hold on. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. Okay, I think I got everybody. Right. I don't know how you do that. How do you get all four screens so quickly? I actually just take two pictures <laughs> and switch between each screen. So okay. I think we're okay. <laughs> yeah, I got them on two screens, so. Excellent, so right. it's uh, right. five right. minutes past 11. Yeah, so it's time for a break. After the break, what's up next? Uh, next is preparing INSAR data for modeling by Garrett. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Brent. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll talk to everybody else in what did we say? 10 minutes? Sure. 1215. Yeah. Thanks. Are we ready? Yes, without further ado, I'll just take over. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say we're ready. Everybody back and awake. Number of cool notebooks that we'll go through now. Yeah, maybe too many. Um, maybe I should do some notebook rationalization. Um, but uh, okay, so we're, we're going into the, um, the folder on um, preparing inside data for modeling, in which we'll find a series of notebooks, we'll go through some of these. Um, just to take you back to what I was talking about on Monday, um, I mentioned the, the, the concept of, of how we, we, we go about um, geophysical modeling um, with inside data. You basically need two things. You need a, a code that can compute model displacements, that's the vector U here. And you also need to know something about the geometry uh, of, the, of, the, of the radar. Um, which can be sort of encapsulated into this pointing vector uh, p hat, and the the, the vector uh, the scalar product of these two vectors 
which uh, I see that the uh, the PowerPoint um, PDF generator has has turned into a cross product, which should be a dot product. Of all the of all the symbols it could have chosen, it chose the one that actually makes makes this factually wrong. But um, just imagine that's a dot. Um, R, the range change, the thing that we measure in INSAR is is the dot product of these two vectors. And the key then is to is to see um, how we how we generate that vector and also how we generate the displacements. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is um, how we use the ACADA model, which is again, this is a slide from Monday, which is a, a very sort of uh, idealized uh, model that we use to, to represent faults and also planar um, igneous intrusions, um, how we can use that uh, to generate a, a synthetic displacement field for a, say for an earthquake, that, that an idealized earthquake, and then how INSAR actually recognize how INSAR actually uh, measures the displacements that, that the model generates. So that's where we're starting. And um, we start like, uh, that with this notebook, Okada LOS components. So go ahead and open that up. Oh, I'm going to activate my chat. Okay, so so here we are. Um, as with all of these things, um, we start with the, the dependencies. Uh, there's an optional install here that I don't think that I think is redundant. I think it actually, because France and his team are, are very responsive to my requests, they actually installed that already. So should try just running this this uh, dependency cell uh, first, and it should run without any errors if you are using the Unavco kernel, um, and we can go ahead from here. So um, this notebook is is uh, is a it runs the Acada um, model for a, a specific fault geometry that we specify, a, a, essentially an earthquake, that um, a model earthquake. And um, there are a few things that we need to provide the code in order to run. And one of them is the elastic moduli, um, uh, the what we call the Lame elastic parameters. Um, these are standard values that are typically assumed for the crust of the continents, 30 gigapascals. So we're just going to go with that and we're not going to worry too much about that. Um, we'll run that cell. Um, and then these are the, the parameters that actually define uh, uh, a fault that slipped in an earthquake. So there are certain um, geometrical parameters, strike, dip, and rake. Um, strike is the orientation of the fault on the map and map view. And dip is its angle to the vertical, with 90 being vertical. Um, rake is the direction of, of fault slip within the fault plane. Um, and, and values of, of 0 or 180 are, are what we call strike slip, where the slip of the fault is in the same direction as the strike. Uh, it can be going left, left lateral or right lateral. You slip to the left or slip to the right. Um, so 0 is left lateral and 180 is right lateral. Uh, I'm not expecting you to remember all these things, but if you care about faults and earthquakes, you'll probably end up learning these. Uh, and then if it's minus 90 or plus 90, then it's either a, a normal fault or a re reverse fault. The, the, hang, the hanging wall, if you remember that term, goes down or up in those, in those cases. Um, the slip is the, is the amount of movement of the fault itself, or the, rather the blocks of rock on either side of it, uh, the relative movement of those two blocks of material. And then we have things like the length of the fault, which is its, its length in the strike direction, the, the, its length in that view, uh, its down dip width, which is its, um, its, its length in, in, in the entire inside the earth, basically the difference in the top and bottom depth um, multiplied by um, or divided by the sign of the dip. And um, some other things, the centroid depth would be the depth of the middle of the fault. And we can also choose where it locates in space. And for this very simple model, we're just going to say it's at the origin of our plot. There's a question, um, Gareth, about the units for all of these here. Units of strike, dip, and rake are in degrees. Um, everything else is in meters. I, I try to be very, uh, very good about that. <laughs> um, so this is a pay, this is a diagram from the actual um, Acada. Card of web page, um, so I, I borrowed it. 
uh, the, the web page is linked here if you want to go there. Um, and uh, it, it describes the geometry of, of actually how the ACADA code sets up the problem. And I've only included this really for completeness. I don't really have time to go through it all. Uh, but since, suffice to say, there's a lot of coordinate transformation you have to do uh, to get the model that we want into the geometry that they, they calculate things. Um, in the ACADA code, it assumes that the fault is parallel with the x-axis. And of course, that's not true. We, we want to rotate our fault to all sorts of orientations. Uh, but anyway, um, the following cells just go through how we, we do those coordinate transformations. So I'm going to run all these, these things. Um, how about there's a, there's a raised hand. Uh, do you want to ask a question real quick before we move on? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, the above parameters, regarding the above parameters that um, the deep break and the slip. So we have to estimate separately these parameters for the earthquake. Uh, well, we're going to get to how we do that later on. Um, but yes, you you can you can go about modeling in one of two ways, as, as I think I mentioned um, on Monday. Oh, okay. Um, okay. You can do forward modeling, which is that we just assume a bunch of fault parameters and we see what happens, see what they look like. Or so this is part the other of the distribution. This is a forward model of one fault, one one rectangle. Okay, for That's this slip distribution, thing. like the uh, slip in the subsurface. Uh, yes, uh, but it, this is slip on on one fault patch, so the slip is uniform. It's not distributed. It's just like okay, where okay. the fault is, it moves, and where the fault is not, it doesn't. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, well, well, yeah. So, so you are many, you are many saying that the uh, you are uh, you are saying the fault is just as a single patch, right? Yes, okay. just as this diagram shows. Okay. Uh, for this case, we can we can make it more, much more complicated, of course, later on, but I don't actually have time to go through how we do all those things. I can I can maybe walk you through it out offline if, if, if that's um, of interest. Yeah, so what we're assuming with these, with these values is, is a fault that is basically oriented north-south, very steeply dipping, um, almost vertical and is going to slip left laterally, two meters. Um, and the the cells, this cell and the following ones, essentially deal with how you you convert from real coordinates and real the real geometry that we want into the geometry that Akada, the Akada routine calculates them. So we have to be able to transform between those two things. Um, just run them, and it will tell you, uh, for example. Um, the location of the centroid of the fault, where the center of the fault, fault plane is. Um, that's one of the things we need to know. Um, it also will convert between um, slip and rake and strike slip and dip slip on the fault, um, which is uh, how the slip is distributed, um, is partitioned into slip that's parallel to the fault strike and fault that's, and slip that's perpendicular to it. Uh, we need to know that. And this, this here is the coordinate transformation between our, our fault coordinates and the ones that Akada uses. Um, and this is all set up just to say, we're going we're gonna to calculate a theoretical earthquake and then see how the different components of, uh, of, of line of sight see that earthquake, um, because it's quite different <laughs> from, from the, uh, the, three dimen the, the three components of, of slip, uh, three components of displacement. So we're going to set up uh, uh, an artificial grid, um, which is 25 by 25 kilometers, uh, or 50 by 50 kilometers, actually centered on zero zero. Uh, we're going to have um, a 500 meter um, pixels for this, which is quite coarse, but it's good enough to see the the pattern that we want to see. And this this cell here runs the um, the, the computation using this uh, Akada wrapper um, package that, that, that we, that we um, initiated at the beginning of the notebook, and we'll, pro we'll plot the output for the three components of displacement. So you run that, and you get these three things. Um, and so we're, they're all plotted with the same um, color scheme, and they, they're, they're contoured, so you can see positive and negative values and, and basically the shape. I think these look like butterflies, um, inside butterfly. 
Um, and so um, what you see is the largest displacements in this particular case, the case that we're looking at, are in the Y component, uh, the north-south component direct of, uh, of this displacement. Um, here, positive values in the east side suggest that the, the east side of the, of the fault, which runs north-south, the east side is moving north and the west side is moving south. But perhaps what you, you might not appreciate, um, and unless you are a scholar of, uh, sort of elastic mechanics, is that uh, even though that's the main movement and the direction of movement of the fault, um, the crust is actually deforming um, both in the east-west direction as well as the vertical direction, as well as in the north-south direction. Um, so what you see, for example, is that um, we know that this side of the fault, the east, the east side of the fault is moving north. Um, and what we see is that the, at the end of the fault that moves, there's a small vertical movement of the crust upwards. And that's because um, you're moving this, this fault into an area where it's not moving and there's actually some compression. And that little compression actually causes the crust to buckle up here or the surface to buckle up. It also ca causes it to move to the east. So there's also eastward movement of the crust there uh, in that same place. Uh, similarly, um, this west side of the fault moving south is causing the crust to buckle here. And so you get, again, vertical uplift um, from the elastic bending of the crust at the end of the fault on the southwest side. And also where you have the crust moving away from, um, from zero motion, you actually get a little bit of stretching. And that stretching causes a little bit of subsidence at the other ends of in the, uh, the northern part of the west side of the fault and the southern part of the east side of the fault. And there's also a, a, an east-west motion associated with that. So the, the pattern is actually quite, quite a bit more complicated than, um, than you might expect. And that's because the fault is finite in length. It doesn't, it doesn't extend beyond the ends of the fault. And so you have to go from fault, that move, fault that's moving to fault that's not moving or crust that's not moving. And in, in the, where those two things meet, um, you get these additional um, perpendicular and vertical movements of, of, the, of the ground. Um, so that's what you would expect, the, the theoretical displacement field for an earthquake of that type. But that is not what INSAR is going to see. INSAR, of course, as we, as we said, resolves things into the, into the line of sight direction. Um, and the line of sight direction um, is defined by several things. The, the direction that the radar antenna is pointing uh, in, in map view, and also the angle that it's pointing at towards the ground. Uh, so what we call the incidence angle and the, the pointing azimuth, the pointing direction. I represented those two angles, um, incidence as, as theta and, and azimuth as, um, as phi here. Um, and so as, as we've mentioned, it's a three-dimensional vector and you can go through the math and we don't have time, unfortunately. I think there is a version of this, this course long ago where I did actually go through the math. Again, that's something we can talk about offline if, if you're interested. But now just take it as read that uh, we, we know these two angles for every pixel that we're interested in. And um, we can, com we can as assemble the, the, the pointing vector from its x, y, and z components. And those are given by these three expressions here. Um, and for, for simplicity for now, we're just going to assume that they're fixed for the, the area that we're looking at, that they don't vary. In practice, they do vary slightly across the across um, any any region of interest that you that you care about. If you're pro if you're processing the full the full frame of of tops, then they vary by quite a bit. The incidence angle varies by about 15 degrees from the near range to the far range, for example. Um, but here we're just going to assume that it's fixed at 39 degrees, um, and we're also going to choose uh, a pointing angle um, for the which points from the um, and I think from the ground target to the satellite, like these angles always are very strange because they're always given as large negative numbers of degrees by, by ice, and I'm using their convention. Um, but for the purposes of this, th this angle is, is consistent with ascending track uh, geometry. So satellite is flying from south to north and pointing um, to the east. So if you evaluate this expression for the angles that you're given here, you can get three numbers um, for the three components. 
And just to, to do a sanity check, I said this is ascending geometry, which means that it should be pointing east and down. Um, so it's pointing positive in the X component and negative in the vertical component, and that's good. Those are what you would expect. Um, and actually from the, the inside viewing geometry, you'll see that the Y component is very slightly north. And if you look at the, the shape of an ascending track interferogram, and I don't have any on hand, but um, you will see that the, the long edge of the interferogram is often, well, for an ascending track, has this kind of shape where the edge points slightly north. But we can, we can talk about that later. But that is, what, that is correct. These are the numbers you would expect. And you can switch out if you want for a descending track, whoops comment one out and, and uncomment the other and run it and you'll get the values for descending. And what you see then is now you're flying from north to south, looking to the west. And uh, so now your pointing vector for the horizontal component is negative. For the east component is negative, it's pointing to the west, uh, but it's still pointing down, 0.77 down. And you see it's also still pointing slightly to the north. But either way, and you know, I'll flip back to ascending. Um, what you see is of the three, um, the, the vertical is usually the largest, although that, that does vary a little bit uh, um, where you are within the swath. Um, the east component is usually the second largest in amplitude, and the north component is the smallest. OK, so we have our pointing vector. We have, our, we have three components of displacement that we can then take the dot product of with this pointing vector. So the next cell just does that dot product and, and shows us the three, how the three components of displacement resolve into those three components of line of sight. Uh, so yes, we're doing the dot product. We run this cell and it will plot it. So you can see here, the X component, the Y component, the Z component, and the sum of those three things, which is what the interferogram would see. And you may be surprised, I don't know, if you, if you remember what the, um, the original displacement field looks like, the Y component is very large in the, uh, in the model displacement field, um, but resolved into line of sight, it almost has no, com no influence at all on the interferogram. There's a very, very small displacement difference between the two sides of this picture, but basically it's close to zero. Whereas the, the X component and the Z component, um, com when projected into line of sight, are quite, quite a lot bigger than, than, than the north-south component uh, projected into line of sight. And um, in, in the case of this kind of, this kind of strike-slip fault, north-south north strike-slip fault, it's only those two things that actually contribute significantly to the interferogram that you get. And not only that, um, but the, the way that they, they sum um, means that on one side of the fault, you get almost complete cancellation of the, of the displacements. And on the other, you get some kind of sum. And what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look, for example, uh, in this area here, the northeast quadrant, you might call that, in the X component, um, that's positive, and in the Z component, that's negative. So when you add that to that, you get something that's close to zero. Similarly, down here, the X component is negative and the Z component is positive. And when you add those two things together, they go to zero as well, or something close to it. Whereas if you look on the other side of the fault, um, this X component here, adds, which is positive, adds to a positive Z component and makes a bigger line of sight displacement. And the same down here. This is negative, so is this. When you add them together, you get a big negative signal. So that's kind of cool. You get a pattern which looks very unlike the three-dimensional displacements pattern. And um, I first discovered this um, when I was processing data for an earthquake in Iran, um, which was on a north-south fault. And the interferogram made absolutely no sense to me until I ran a model like this to try and figure out what on earth was going on. And we can also, of course, run this again by swapping out our pointing vectors so that we are looking at the descending track. Um, and if you do that and run that cell again, and then run this cell again, maybe you could predict what might happen to the displacement pattern. Um, 
Now all the displacement in the interferogram is on the east side of the fault. Uh, and why is that? Well, in reversing the, the pointing direction of the satellite, um, uh, you've reversed the, the, the X component of line of sight. And so now you get the constructive um, addition on the east side and the destructive addition on the west side. I see, uh, can I explain the, re the reason for the Y component? Uh, why is the Y component, why doesn't it contribute much to, to line of sight? Um, the reason is because the satellite track direction is pretty close to north-south, which means for a right looking radar, uh, the radar is pointing almost, but not entirely east-west. Um, so if you were um, on uh, an airplane, so UAV SAR, um, which is a, a mission that, that, um, that NASA operates, a plane with a radar on it, you can choose your flying direction. Um, then, then you can have a, a satellite that, uh, or a radar that points north-south. And then, that, then, then this wouldn't be true. But for satellites, because they're trying to optimize their time in the sun, they fly in a polar orbit, which is synchronized to the Earth's rotation so that they get their, their solar panels lit up all day. Um, and so um, in, in, in orbits that are polar, basically the satellite flies over the poles, flies north-south and south to north and north to south all day. Uh, and so we have almost no sensitivity to the, to the, uh, to the Y component. It's the recommendation then to have both ascending and descending tracks to do a full interpretation of a north-south striking fault. It certainly helps. Um, if you have um, those two interferograms, you can you can you can separate the vertical component from the east-west component. Often, approximately separate those two effects, and that's really helpful um, for understanding what's going on. Uh, but I it, also it's, add... <clears throat> it's Frank said an uh, interesting point. There are some limitations with the satellite geometries that we have uh, to understand um, motion that goes in a north-south direction. Uh, there, there are some techniques that you may have heard of, uh, MAI or so, to, that try to estimate these things a bit better. But the, uh, the geometry of observation um, often causes some limitations in estimating north-south uh, uh, movement. Yeah. These are all topics that I could I could expand on at length. <laughs> I used to have a <laughs> I used to have a, a, a lecture on that three component this decomposition thing. Um, so one thing that I should say is that this is all for a right looking radar, which is what Sentinel One is. Um, NICE is going to be left looking, which means that even though that we're going to be quite insensitive to the to the Y component. Um, NICEL will resolve it the other way around to Sentinel, which means that we might have the ability to, to actually uh, estimate the North component better than, than um, previously with that. Jesse asked, North-South normal fault works well? Yes, it does, because most of the motion is vertical or, or east-west. You don't understand why both ascending and descending point slightly north. That's just the geometry of a of a pole, of a sun synchronous polar orbit that they they do that. Um, you look at the edges of of interferograms and they both have they both are tilted. This is be an ascending one and descending one. They're both tilted like this, so they both point slightly north. Ask I guess that's a good question for someone like Paul who's involved in mission design. Um, but we don't really have time to go through all these all these interesting questions right now, or not at least not if we're going to finish today. We're already halfway through the time slot. <laughs> okay, keep going, Gareth. Yeah, I'm going to keep going. Um, so um, the next thing we're going to talk about, and the next something I did mention, I think as well. Will this allow me to click on my tabs? Maybe. Um, is downsampling of data. This is a slide I showed on Monday as well, showing uh, an interferogram which has been downsampled, um, turned into turned from millions of pixels into a few hundred. Um, the reason that we can do this is the data are very very correlated spatially. Um, all the pixels in this in, in these areas are basically moving the same amount in the same direction, 
And so you don't need all of them to describe that, that, that component or that part of the interferogram. You can turn it into a, a much, much more sparsely sampled um, patch. How does this work? This quad tree decomposition idea, I'm just gonna show you a PowerPoint slide really fast. Um, the idea is that you have, uh, this be your interferogram, this box, um, and um, you sample it. Um, well, you, what you do is you divide it into four pieces and you calculate the variance within each box. And you have a threshold, sort of maximum variance that you want to see within a, a single box on your interferogram. And if the variance of any of these boxes is larger than that threshold, uh, you say, okay, this is, this, is too, this is too various, too variable. I'm gonna divide this into four more patches and do this again. And um, if then um, the variance is higher than what you would want, then you divide it up again, and you divide it up again until you've turned your interferogram into essentially a series of smaller and smaller boxes with the smallest boxes being where the most vari variation happens in your data. That's the idea. Um, and I have a notebook which does this. Um, it's called Quad Tree Decomposition um, after the, the method we're talking about. And it makes use of uh, some freely available Python-based uh, tools written by a group in Germany called PyRocco, which has uh, a Quad Tree routine called Kite. Um, and these also should be installed, so you don't have to run the first notebook to try and install them, they're already there. So you, we can run this import um, and, and, and initialize everything. Um, we're gonna use an interferogram from Turkey from an earthquake that happened um, about 18 months ago, I think, maybe a bit more. Um, if you run this cell, it will download those, the, the ICE files that we're interested in for this earthquake. Uh, from AWS, from, from Amazon, from the Amazon cloud, uh, and they'll download them into your local directory. So you can see, for example, we've just downloaded the filtered top of phrase unwrap.geo. This is the, the final filtered unwrapped geocoded interferogram um, and its metadata. Uh, next, we're going to get this LOS file, um, which is the, the, the line of sight information. It contains the, the instance and azimuth for every pixel in, in geocoded geometry. We're gonna download a water mask, which is something actually I mean to ask some of the developers here, because there used to be a script that worked to make this and now it doesn't work anymore. So I wonder if there's a solution for that, because it's a very useful thing to be able to mask out the water. Uh, and finally, we're going to download, download the correlation file. So the information on where, this, where the signal strength is good and where the signal strength is bad, you know, where the surface may have changed and where it hasn't, which is a way of masking out bad pixels. Um, so hopefully these will be done shortly. And we can run the listing just to make sure they all downloaded right when that's done. You should have a bunch more files in your in your directory. Okay, this is just setting up some file names and file paths. Um, you name the, the filtered interferogram, the the jump, the the, um, uh, the correlation file, and the water mask. Um, so those are set up. Um, here is uh, the radar wavelength, which is apparently not in the metadata for any of these data files that we have. That we have downloaded. Note to the, the ICE developers that would be kind of useful. Um, the people at, at, at PyRocco complain about that actually. So you have to manually convert your, your displacements if you use this. So we're going to do that. We'll also specify a minimum coherence or minimum correlation um, so that our, we can mask out the very worst pixels. Um, so we do that. And this uses the, the kite. Um, routine to load in your interferogram and your line of sight information. Um, and it is imported. Okay, this, this, this object is what contains all that. And we can plot what it loaded in. Um, this thing sc.displacement is going to be the interferogram. And when you plot it um, using matplotlib, you get this. This is the interferogram, looks very nice. Um, you will see that these values are in radians still because it hasn't done the conversion yet. 
that we'll have to do that manually ourselves. This is just done in um, pixel number, not in anything else. And slightly annoyingly, Kite uses the lower left pixel as the, as the reference, which means when we load everything in with, with um, GDAL, which we're about to do, we have to flip everything from north to south to make them, make them match the uh, coordinate system that, uh, that Iroko uses. Okay, so this is loading in the correlation file and the water mask. Um, you see we're using uh, command gdal.open. Really useful if you want to load your, um, your data in as a, as a NumPy array. So that's all we're doing here. Um, it's great, actually. And we can, um, let's see, we take the displacements from that are loaded into Pyroco and convert them to, to line of sight displacement in meters by multiplying by the wavelength um, and dividing by four pi. And next we're gonna mask out things that are um, below, below one in our water mask. Um, these are things that are not water, um, not land, sorry. So we'll mask them out, we'll turn them into not a number and we'll also zero out anything that's below the correlation threshold. And at the end of this, we can we can run matplotlib again, and now you'll see we're missing a, some stuff. Um, this, this, this is a, a, a lake that's a, a dammed river, and this is the Euphrates River, uh, which interestingly um, and 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 not not inconsequentially is offset right where the the earthquake happened um, by about ten kilometers, I think. And that's because the Euphrates River is offset by the East Anatolian Fault, which runs through here and was the source fault for this earthquake. So geologically, it's offset one of the largest rivers in, in the Middle East. Um, and no surprise, that's where the, the earthquake actually happened. Okay, so um, Quadri then, um, we, the command to do Quadri in, um, uh, in, in, in Kite is take the object with the loaded data and dot Quadri and it will do it. Um, interestingly, it does the quadri first, and then you can specify the parameters second. So this takes a little, a few seconds to, to figure out. And then we can specify how we want to sample the data that we have. Um, and while it, we're waiting, maybe uh, this question is, how, this might be a straightforward question, is, is the minimum coherence threshold something that you know from the history of the location? It's usually somewhere between 0.2 and 0.4 that data go bad. Um, if we were being more conservative, we'd probably choose a slightly higher value. Um, and that's pretty much true for everywhere, actually. Um, but though anything below 0.2 is probably quite bad for the, for the correlation. Um, but it is a, it can be a bit of a trial and error thing. And you can certainly compare your, your, your data to, uh, you can look at them, look at the, uh, the wrapped into the program and see if there are noisy areas that you're not getting rid of. Um, and try it upping the threshold. So here are the parameters that control the, um, the quadri decomposition. Um, and so some of these um, are, are approximately what you might want for an earthquake of this size. This was a magnitude 6.7. It's a moderate, moderate to large-ish earthquake. Um, you can specify how big the biggest cells you want to be, uh, to have are 0.2 degrees, which is about 20 kilometers. Um, you can also specify how small the smallest ones are. 0.01 uh, degrees is like a hundred meters. Oh, sorry, no, one kilometer. To do the conversions in my head. Uh, this one is the variance threshold in in the units of your of your data squared. Um, so we went we converted to meters um, of displacement. Uh, so this is 0 0.02 meters squared. Um, and this is something that you, you do have to experiment with, but this value works quite well for the, for the data that we're looking at. And um, this, this, set, this here is um, uh, um, the allowed number of NANs in a cell. So you see that there, we've zeroed out a bunch of data, but of course there's data all around them. If you, if you make this number low, then it's going to divide up cells where there are lots of NANs. If you make this la large, then it will completely ignore the NANs. So somewhere in between is, is a good compromise, perhaps. Anyway, you run this and it will scale your data and it will tell us 
in the next cell how many blocks we have um, divided our interferogram into. And there's 194 of them, which is, I think, that's actually quite a good number. Of course, you can, you can mess around with these parameters, say, okay, 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.01, and then run it again, and now you'll get a lot more. So depending on, I don't know, how complex your, your pattern is, maybe that works for you, but I've had very good results running at 0 0.02, and I recommend you do it too, because then your models will run quite fast. Um, if you're interested in seeing where these, these locations are, um, um, these are the relative locations of the of, of each um, of each quadtree cell with respect to the origin in degrees of east and, and north. And these are the mean values of displacement within each of those boxes. And you say there are 194 of them, so you could look at them all if you wanted. But the easiest thing to do is actually to plot them, which is what this this unit this does. And there you get the figure I showed in my in my talk the other day. Um, Right now, because this is a separate notebook from the one that then turns this into model, modelable data, um, you can save your, your, um, your workspace as a file, and then we'll, we'll pick up the next notebook and look at, um, look at those. Okay, so this one turns your, out, your output from, from Kite into, into a text file that we can then model. Um, we're going to do that. Um, so we loaded in our, our things. Um, and uh, we're going to quadri it again, just for fun. Um, and what the rest of this notebook does is it converts the, um, the coordinates from lat long into, um, into a, a, a rectilinear um, coordinate system, a Cartesian coordinate system like UTM meters, the universal transverse Mercator. Um, um, and that's just because uh, almost all of the, code, the codes that we use, if you remember back half an hour ago to us looking at ACADA, ACADA does everything in meters. So we want to be using a, a local meter based coordinate system to, to do this modeling. We can run it, off it goes. So it tells us the reference point of the, of the data is, is whatever it is. And it also tells us what it is in the, the local UTM zone. Okay, so that's, the, that's, that's what everything that we, that Kite reports is relative, relative to. And we can do UTM conversions of all the, all the points, the focal points of each, of each quadri cell, what, the, what Kite calls leaves, um, and convert them all to, um, um, to UT, UTM coordinates. And it also extracts the line of sight vector components uh, for each of those points from the information that it loaded in when, we load, when it loaded it in, which is cool. So we don't have to worry about that. And actually then all we do for the rest of this is dump out these coordinates into, into a file. This is, this is the interferogram plotted now in UTM coordinates in kilometers. Um, in kilometers historically because um, we had a code that read in coordinates in kilometers uh, when I was a graduate student um, and output them all to text files. So uh, at the end of this, it should have made two files um, that are going to be called um, Elazig, which is the name of the earthquake, probably pronounced wrong, um, ascending because it's an ascending interferogram, um, LL for lat long, Dot Okin. Okin was the name of the code that, that we used to use and which my codes are set up to, to read. And um, a version that is not in that long, um, one that's actually in um, local UTM kilometers. So if you run this command, once you've got to the bottom of this notebook, cat alazig asc dot okinv, you have a seven col column file. These are the X and Y coordinates of your data point. Um, in, in kilometers. This is the amount of displacement of that point. And then these three columns, these three numbers are the three components of, of the line of sight vector, the east, the north, and the, the vertical. The last column is just a, a label. So everyone good? 
I hope. Oh, I'll look at the time. Yeah, there's some yeah. questions, but we kept on answering them. Excellent. Um, if you have specific questions that aren't answered, we can always cover them in office hours. Now I'm loading um, a copy forward model, is what it's called. Um, a copy is, is uh, a, a, a series of Python um, functions that I wrote that more or less encapsulate the, the ACADA function into a more usable form. Um, it does most of the things I, I showed um, uh, the very first the very first notebook. Um, so you can re read read in the dependencies, um, load in the, the OCHIM file that we just that we just made. We can show that NumPy read it in OK, and there are seven columns um, with all these numbers in. And I converted the the, the x coordinates back into meters. Um, so this, this earthquake, um, if we go back to our, our data here from the previous notebook, I eyeballed what the, what I thought the strike of this fault would be. It's kind of an angle, um, I have like tilt my, my hand at about 60 degrees strike, the, the orientation of the fault, I guessed at 60. Um, I made some guesses about the, the length of the pattern, you know, how, how long this thing is on the map based on, you know, this, this length scale here, I guessed at 25 kilometers, I guessed some other things. Um, and I, I wrote all of those into, into a, a, a NumPy array here, um, strike dip, rate, slip, X, Y, length, top and bottom, just like before um, uh, when we were running the forward model for Ricardo, but now for example, the x coordinate is a real x coordinate, and the y coordinate is a real y coordinate. It's not just at zero zero; it's wherever it is on the map. Uh, I also made an array of, of, of elastic values, elastic parameters, like before, um, because Ricardo needs them. Um, and um, this this function here, rect shear fault, um, actually runs uh, Ricardo on the parameters that, the parameters that you feed it. And the data points that you that you've read in, so you run that, and then we can plot it. And on the left is our uh, is our data, quadrant like before, and on the right is this Ocada model that we just ran. Um, and you see it's it's okay. It doesn't doesn't the pattern doesn't match exactly. Um, you could probably mess around a little bit. Uh, with with the, the values to make this look better, you could probably change the length of the fault. You could probably change the dip, um, um, but for a kind of complete eyeballing, um, it's not so bad. Um, of course, we can do better than just eyeballing it. We can actually numerically calculate how well the the two the two patterns match. Um, we can we do that by differencing the two sets of displacements squaring them and adding them all together, squaring the differences and adding them all together, that gives you a positive number uh, that we call the total squared penalty. Um, and we can evaluate that here. We just, this is how you calculate it. You square, you sum the squares of the differences um, and you can write that out. And it says the ten, total squared penalty is 0.433 meters squared. Okay, that, of course, like looking at this number on its own is, um, not especially meaningful in, in that it does depend on how many data points you have, what penalty you get is, which is why I recommend you all be using the same um, quadri parameters as me so that your results will be comparable with mine. Um, um, yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, except the one thing, one, one other thing to be aware of, and one thing we have to account for uh, is that INSAR is of course a completely relative set of measurements. And what do I mean by that? It, we don't know where zero is. Um, you assume perhaps for an earthquake that zero is not near the earthquake, like the far field, far away from the earthquake, displacement should be zero. Um, but that's not gonna be the case necessarily for the data. The data are referenced to wherever it started unwrapping the data, often is the middle of the interferogram. Um, so the values need not match perfectly just because of this, what we call like the, the zero level shift that the data contain and the model doesn't. 
but we can solve for that by just calculating what the mean difference is between these two, um, these two models and subtracting that out. So that what you get really is the, is the real penalty. <laughs> so the zero level shift is two centimeters and we've got rid of it now. So our, our penalty has gone down a little bit. Um, and so this last cell allows you to, to run the model again, um, get rid of the, the zero level shift and actually show you what the, the difference, the pattern of difference is, what we might call the residual. This is the data minus the model. And um, you can see that um, there are some things that we're not fitting fairly well. Like for example, you can see in this area here, uh, the data is, is larger than, than the model. Uh, larger in a negative sense. And so when you subtract this from that, you get a large, um, a large misfit. Um, and you could manually go through, and maybe you want to try this just to gain intuition for what you're doing, you and go through and actually mod manually change these parameters to different values and see what happens to your model. Um, and hopefully you can find a model that fits better than this one. Um, but I'm fairly impatient about these sorts of things. And so what I'm gonna show you next is how you can get the computer to solve it for you, uh, which is really what you want, I, am, I imagine. So our final notebook of the day is Okapi optimization. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a computer algorithm to tweak the model, tweak the forward model that we just calculated. Um, we we'll specify some bounds for it to vary the parameters a little bit and then see if the algorithm can find a combination of model parameters that fits the data better with a smaller penalty than the one we just um, than the one we just ran. Okay, so I'm going to load in all the same things again. Um, and here is my is the place where I'm um, going to specify um, some 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 guess values, the ones I just used, um, and also some um, some bounds. So here are some guesses of what the, the parameters might be. Here are some, some theoretical bounds uh, or sigmas, um, one standard deviation. Um, we can choose how many standard deviations we're going to search over. Probably two standard deviations is, is a good number to, to define a, 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 a parameter range that we can test. Um, you don't want to go too big because then it will spend a lot of time running models that are meaningless. Um, and so what this, this is going to do is it's going to, um, it's going to initialize, initialize, initialize some, 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 um, some arrays that contain these numbers, that contain the bounds of these numbers. So 60 plus two times 10 for the upper bound, 60 minus two times 10 for the lower bound. Um, and it will also select at random a model from within those bounds, like a set of, set of model parameters that, that come within those bounds. Uh, it does also a sanity check just to make sure that the, the bottom of the fault is not above the top of the fault. And so it's swap them around if, if that's the case. And what we get at the end of it is a starting guess model. So here are some parameters that are guessed by the, by, by at random from within those um, parameter ranges that we've defined. Strike is similar to the one I guessed. The dip is very different. This dip of 60 degrees. The rake is different, less slip, uh, anyway. Or is it slightly more? Changes the fault location, changes the length, the top and bottom depths. Okay, this is cool. Um, that's that's cool. And we'll we'll also um, uh, initiate some elastic parameters like before. Uh, so we want to see, for example, how good our starting model, our guess is. Um, and this model is worse than the one I had before, the one I eyeballed myself. Okay, that's interesting. But it's only a, a starting model. Um, what the algorithm we're about to use does is it takes your starting model and starts to tweak it. It tweaks it um, by changing one of the parameters and seeing how the misfit changes when you change that parameter. And if it keeps improving the misfit, the misfit gets smaller, then it keeps going until it no longer improves the misfit. Then it chooses another parameter and then does the same thing. And it does that over and over again until, until it zeroes in on a, on a model which doesn't get any better. This algorithm is called the Powell algorithm. Um, and I, I've linked to the Wikipedia page for it if you want to read more about it. Um, so we can run um, using 
this, this function in SciPy, which is another standard toolbox that is built into Python, um, the minimize function saying method equals power, um, and we're going to feed it our, um, our penalty function, calculator, the model, starting model that we're going to use, some additional information, um, our elastic parameters in our data, and also we're going to feed it our, um, our bounds on our model, upper and lower bounds. Um, so we do that. And it will take a little while because now it's trying to model uh, model our data. And, and what it's actually doing is every time it tweaks the model parameter, it reruns the ACADA routine. So every time it runs, it'll it runs the ACADA thousands of times. And we can we can look at what it outputs, this results thing. Um, and it gives us various things. It gives us, for example, all the directions that it tested in parameter space. So all the combinations of parameters that it varied, including some of them um, are just varying one parameter and some of varying combinations of parameters. Uh, what our penalty function is at the end of it, uh, this is quite a good one actually, 0.112. I'm reasonably happy with that. Uh, it says that it, it terminated successfully. It said that it ran um, a, a card at 2,400 times. Um, lucky it's fast. Um, and these are the four parameters that it spat out at the end. Strike, dip, rake, slip, x and y coordinates, length, top depth, and bottom depth. Um, so you can run this next cell and it will label them all for you, like so. So you see that um, it found quite a nice improvement in, in, in the penalty from its starting guess to the, to the end. Uh, I see Alex is, is querying my 96 degree dip. <laughs> it turns out that the Ocado equations work just fine um, with greater than 90, which means it's dipping or 84 degrees the other way. Um, so yes, you can do that conversion. You, want, you would add 180 degrees to the strike and you would subtract the dip from 180 to get in conventional coordinates. It's amazing how blase you get about these sorts of things when you used to care a lot about them as a, as a geology student. Um, anyway, here's the output. Um, I would like everyone to run this um, themselves. Um, and the reason I would like to do that um, is that what we're looking for is the best model. And um, it's not clear from one run that what I have done is the best model. What I have produced is the best model. Um, there is a problem with these highly parameterized models. This has got nine parameters, nine things that you can change. Um, uh, the problem is that, that um, we have what we call local minima which is a combination of, um, of parameters that is the best model for some, some part of the, of the, the parameter space, um, but maybe not the best one. But we fell into this hole and now we're in it. I like to think of this as, um, as like thinking about how, you, if you, how you're going to find the deepest crater on the moon by walking into craters or walking downhill. Uh, so you can think of parameter space as, as some kind of landscape, and you want to find the deepest part of that landscape. Um, and, but if you're walking on that landscape and you, fall, you walk into a crater, um, you're going to find you're going to bottom out, and nothing you do in that that neighborhood is going to improve your depth. You're not going to get any deeper, but you found the bottom of from where you started. So, so that's the model you, you you've, you've come stuck on. That's the location you've come stuck on. Um, uh, if you started walking from some other place, always walking downhill, you might find a deeper crater, especially if you, know, you started right in front of one and there's a deeper crater, two craters away, then starting from a different place might mean you find it to a, 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 a better location. Um, so what I'm going to do, what I have done, is I have made a spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do with my model is I'm going to paste it into this thing. Um, I'm going to share the link with you guys. Anyone on the internet with the link can edit, copy the link. I'm pasting it into chat right now. 
Right, there are three things I want from you or from your run. I want your, uh, your name, your, your penalty function value. Let's see, penalty there, name. And then the whole string of, of, of your, um, your, your array here. Copy that and paste that into the third. Don't, oh, hang on. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it into a single string. How to do that. Uh, well, what we can do maybe um, is make a cell and just paste all this in there, in there. make it to a single, single string without carriage returns in it first. That. I did. People who are more more uh, spreadsheet savvy can can do it better than me. <laughs> uh, there you go. What we're doing here is basically what I would what we would try and do. Um, uh, I'm parallelizing the problem. <laughs> I'm running the model lots. We're running the model lots of times at the same time, and so we're going to have a, a a reasonably rapid end result. So as you go along, please do all fill in your own lines, and we'll see if we can find the best one. I see some point one oh nines, which are obviously better than mine. Yeah, I see a bunch of people that beat you. Science wins. It's not, it's, not, it's not about the glory of any individual person. But do make sure that the whole string makes it in there, not just like one small part of it. Because obviously, if we want to, if we want to use your best model, we have to be able to, to access all of the parameters, not just the first four or whatever. So you, as you'll see, um, I, I kind of got around with it by making a new code cell and pasting my array in it and then deleting all the carriage returns. So that it's all in one line now. And that's the easiest way, I think, without overthinking it. Hmm. Maybe I should task someone with finding what the, the lowest value is. Because of course we can do a sort, but... Um, only once this is all done. It says there is a heavy traffic in the slide. Anyone? Anyone talking? Yes. Someone's making a minimum cell somewhere. That would be cool. Do it over on the right somewhere. <laughs> See the dynamics slow down a bit. <laughs> you should move that up a bit, I think. <laughs> How many people are in the in the chat right in the, in the session right now? I can't see that, but you have 81. Okay. You probably can move it up to 100 and wouldn't. Um <laughs> it didn't make so we're missing there. Uh, Gerrit, how long how long more do you have? We are over time, by the way. Yeah, well, we're, we're basically done after this. We're going to, I have a little more, one more, two more things to say. Um, so some, if you could point out which cell that is, and maybe highlight it in gold or something, as the, as the winner. There's one that's bold. Where is that? Hanan, oh. okay, brilliant. Congratulations, you are the winner. 
winning doesn't gain you any prizes, but you know the the uh, approbation of your of your peers. I'm going to paste that string into best f params, and I'm also going to paste the value just for just for fun into my into my notebook cell. And what we'll do is we'll plot this and see how well it fits. But best f params is not defined. I didn't run it. <laughs> okay, well I just did run it. Ooh, and look at that. So um, here's, here's your starting data. Here's your model. Yeah, it looks pretty decent. The the extent of the blue area is is now much closer to um, where it was in the data, and, and same on the other side. And this is the, the residual. So we're not fitting every detail. I mean, if you look in the data the data pattern in detail, there are maybe two two concentrations of, of high values. And of course, we're only using one rectangle to fit the, uh, the model, but that's pretty good. I mean, for a single fault model, I would be happy with that. And I'm quite hard to please. Um, <laughs> um, so what, what, what I've included in here, just for the last thing to mention is that if you wanted to do this and you don't have say a hundred friends to run the model for you at the same time, what what you would obviously do is you would just run a loop. Um, you'd run the code 100 times from different starting models and see if you can find the best one yourself. So all I have done here is I've mocked up how, uh, a very simple way of doing that, starting with the best penalty function variable um, and make that best penalty function when you start out a very, very high number so that when you get a model that fits well, your model, <laughs> your, your model fit should be better than that. Um, and you can run this and, and it will output, you know, the best fun and best params that then you can go and plug into these guys. You would fit, plug them in here and plot the residual and see how well it's done. Um, that's all I've got to talk about. Uh, I see a question from Alex. Can we scratch our heads over the causes of the residuals in this best fitting model? Is there something to that at the fault tips? Well, almost certainly um, if, the dip, if the depth of slip changes at the ends of the fault or the pattern of slip is elliptical, then a rectangle is not gonna capture that. And we're using a single rectangle. As I said, there's also probably two asperities in the earthquake. There's probably two, cl two clusters of fringes in the, in the interferogram and two clusters of displacement in the unwrapped interferogram. And we can't really fit both of them um, with a single rectangle. What you can do then after this is you can fix your fault geometry, you can make it bigger, divide it into lots of small pieces and solve for the slip on the fault, um, which we don't have time to do today, but that would be a legitimate thing to do next. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I'm giving away the secrets of my trade here, but this is basically how you do it. This is how you model earthquakes. In the interest of time uh, and Haresh's schedule, I think we should probably move on. Yes. Uh, there's so much more that could be asked. Uh, I know we just need more time for these things, but there's office hours and uh, the Slack channel. Oh so. yeah, and to say, um, what the homework would be to try and do this yourself. Um, if you have another earthquake you want to look at, you can try and model it. Or you can try and run the, the the full hundred models yourself and see if you can do better than the one we've just found. Yeah, this is a really fun, fun it's set participating. Of that was pretty, very dynamic spreadsheet for a while. Yeah, that that was really a great exercise. Very interactive. Well done. All right, let's let's move on. Uh, maybe. We can skip the break in the interest of time. We only have one hour left. Is that all right with everybody? So Haresh can get back to whatever else he has to do after this. All right, let's get, let's keep going. Go ahead. Um, Haresh, sure. So. Is this big enough or should I go to presentation mode? Big enough for me. Okay. 
That, that's worse. Now it's in the, uh, yeah, swap displays. There Is we go. Either? Yep, yep. All right. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the atmospheric delay, tropospheric delay in inside data. Well, in general, atmospheric delay. But first, I will just show you a few slides on, um, on, the, on the theory of the tropospheric delay. And then there is a notebook that's um, uh, prepared by uh, our colleague, David Becker. Um, I will show you where is it. So that's the, that's the homework for the tropospheric delay part, uh, which you can go through and basically uh, try to estimate the delay for, for an interferogram. Uh, but before, before getting there, uh, let's, um, uh, let's go through some details of the atmospheric delay in general. The slides are really new uh, in that sense that I prepared last night. So I'll put them in the, in the report later. It will be available to you. Um, it's, it's a summary of some old package that I had five, six years ago, but I don't think if the technology has changed much. So just going to the basics, we are doing interferometry and uh, we are usually in this course, we are interested in displacement in the interferometry phase, which might not be the only component, and there might be the delay due to the propagation of the microwave signal through the atmosphere, uh, some geometrical residual, even though we did flattening, uh, some decorrelation noise, and perhaps some other components that I don't want to go to the details. But spe specifically about atmosphere, well, Oh, we are flattening an interferogram, and uh, for that, we are computing the um, uh, geometrical phase. So right there, we have some assumptions. We, we, are, we are, in, in all those geometrical computation, uh, um, we are assuming that the speed of the light is uh, basically speed, speed of our electromagnetic wave in atmosphere is, is in vacuum. Well, that's, that's not true, right? We have atmosphere and the uh, refraction index is not one anymore. It's something more than one. That, that causes a delay in the, in the signal propagation. Um, to remind you that in interferometry, we are um, looking at differential observations, differential in time and in space. Uh, specifically for repeat pass interferometry, I, ha I have this cartoon here where we have time one and time two. And for, for, for our interferogram, we have also two pixels. It turned out that the delay that we are observing, the, the atmospheric delay, is the integral of the uh, refractivity, which is just uh, uh, one minus refraction index. And uh, over, over the range from the radar to the target uh, for, for, uh, for between two pixels, between two times and between two pixels. So note that in this integral of the refractivity over time, we have for pixel P and also we have for pixel Q and also we have two times Ti and Tj. So if we, in, in theory, if we would know what's the refractivity, uh, at different layers of atmosphere from ground surface all the way to the radar, we could just integrate it and get the delay and remove it from our observations, from which is interferometric phase. Uh, the refractivity can be explained by equations like this one, um, where there are some constants, K1, K2, K3, and, and the rest, but also there are some atmospheric parameters like the, uh, um, the atmospheric basically dry dry pressure and uh, which is p the uh, temperature atmospheric temperature which is t e which is the water vapor partial pressure that's the dominant source of the tropospheric delay because it's um, in in a differential sense actually in in absolute sense the dry delay is larger it's around three meters up to three meters um, but uh, the variation over time is small however the water vapor part, uh, the wet delay is smaller, 20, 30 centimeters, but its spatial and temporal variation is much larger. 
And then there is much smaller contribution compared to those contributions is from cloud um, water content. And also there is ionosphere, which is another layer of the, uh, of the atmosphere where we have the electrons. And I will go to more details in the second part of this lecture. There are many ways really to uh, account for tropospheric delay in INSAR data. Unfortunately, unfortunately, none of them are working uh, great. We, the tropospheric delays remains challenging, but I have, I have this plot of, you know, you can think of filtering, um, which, which has been done a lot, stacking, spatial temporal filtering, common scene interferogram combination, um, assuming some statistical properties of atmosphere and design a filter or some more empirical approach as you assume that the troposphere is stratified, which is to some good extent, and you can just assume a, a linear, linear uh, relationship between the phase and topography and account for that. Uh, or you could, you could have a little bit more variations of that. And then there are ways uh, based on the satellite spectrometers which, uh, which was an um, opportunity when we had NVSAT, um, now, which didn't have only SAR sensor, but also some, some spectrometer, which was giving us, at the same time as the radar observations, was giving us some optical observation that we could estimate the delay, the, the uh, width delay. And then um, there are some other satellites like MODIS. There has been some studies on trying to get MODIS data and correct the INSAR data. The problem really is the time is different between the two satellites and, uh, and uh, there are daylight, uh, we need daylight as well, which is not always available basically. So, so there are other ways using GPS data and also using GPS plus atmospheric models. So the, the notebook that David has prepared is based on uh, a model called KCOS, I guess, if I am pronouncing it right, which they have tried to use GPS uh, plus some atmospheric models to come up with a with estimation of the tropospheric delay in INSAR data. And there are pure atmospheric model approaches, which there are a couple of packages out there that you can, you can explore more. Um, of course, um, as probably you would, you would expect, if we have an spectrometer that takes data at the same time as our inside observation, well, that would be the best um, if we don't have cloud. Uh, so that was the case for, for NVSAT, as I mentioned. This is one example from long ago that I did. Um, this is INSAR interferogram, and that's the expected delay based on the MERIS observation MEDIS was on NVSAT, that was the spectrometer on NVSAT, which was giving us the water vapor. So it's a it's little bit noisy, but the fringe pattern is there, and that's after correction. Another example that the interferogram, and then you see what we get from uh, MEDIS is really very well predicting what, what we observed, and that's the residual. Um, another example that the interferogram we had after correction with Mary's, almost all the tropospheric delays gone, but with um, atmospheric models, we didn't get much. Um, basically, it was not successful in this case. So, so there are a couple of publications you can, you can dig into. David has a couple as well um, uh, that um, it showed statistically, whenever the spectrometer data are available, uh, of course, it works better. But the problem is they are not available. Uh, NVSAT is not live anymore. Sentinel doesn't have that sensor. And uh, even if they are available, you have problem with cloud and you need day daylight. OK, so that's why there are other methods based on the atmospheric models. The assumption is the, and the fact is the troposphere is stratified and shaped by the topography of the, of the ground. So here is one example, good example, that the dim of the area, and that's the interferogram. So just visually, you can see that there is a significant correlation. And you can see that one-to-one um, -one plot 
shows shows that correlation nicely. Another example that shows uh, same same thing. And another example that you have an interferogram, the tropospheric delay estimated from from atmospheric model in this case, Erin Trim uh, does a very good job in predicting the delay, probably because we have good topography variation. Uh, so that's that's promising as well. Another example over Hawaii that the atmospheric model is doing a good job. Um, one one more plot that I like myself uh, from a from a five six years old paper. Um, uh, we 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 demonstrated that actually the no no surprise that we see the seasonality of the tropospheric delay in the inside observation. In gray is is the um, delay from atmospheric models. And uh, blue and red are what we observed in a time series analysis uh, in SAR data over, over some regions in, in uh, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, so so that, that seasonality has been, has been observed. And if we look at the GPS observation uh, over, over US and estimate that Seasonal seasonality of the tropospheric delay. You see a ramp across US, which is which is very interesting, showing that there is more seasonal variation of the delay in the east compared to the west, and uh, probably that's that's expected based on the climate. Uh, we did a little bit more analysis, and we showed uh, that um, if you look at the tropospheric, if you if you if we assume that the modis is giving us the more accurate tropospheric delay from spectrometry, um, then the, the distribution is not normal distribution, it's, it's skew normal distribution. And that's because the delay has this seasonal variation. It's not only stochastic random uh, process. It, it has some systematic and stochastic behaviors. And then if you account, if you remove that seasonal variation from MADIS, then you get more stochastic part, more random part in time. However, if you would remove, uh, if you would just remove the error entry from MADIS, you would get the same thing. Basically, that skewness is gone, which means the seasonality is gone, and the standard deviation of the stochastic part is reduced. So that's really the, the general feeling that's at least I personally have, and based on my experience, um, that that the correction of the tropospheric delay with the atmospheric models takes care of the seasonal variation and slightly reduces the standard deviation of the stochastic part by 10, 20%. And um, so I'll, I'll stop there uh, with, this, with this introduction. And um, I will point you, if you have any, question, let me know. I'll, I'll try to put these slides in the, uh, in the... I'll stop sharing this one and I'll share my browser. All right. Yeah. Let me make sure that it's big enough. All right. So uh, there is a there is a notebook. If you go to GeoSync, uh, UNAFCO, and then Troposphere, Ionosphere, go to Troposphere folder. And there is this notebook, Tropo um, IPython, uh, prepared by David Becker and Simran Sanka, that you can, uh, that's the homework for you. Uh, there, you are, there is an interferogram in Kurdistan, um, uh, which you can, the, the interferogram is already processed. It's a co-seismic um, earthquake in 2017. Um, so the notebook downloads that, that interferogram from an S S3 bucket and uh, uh, and also is is set up to to 
um, prepare the tropospheric relay based on the KCAS data. So I will I will let you guys later after after um, we are done with the ionosphere uh, as a homework you can go through that uh, that notebook yourself. Please zoom Over. in, Rush. I'm sorry. Please zoom in so that uh, sure it fills more of your screen. Thanks. Um, let me go to the ionosphere one and then zoom in even more. All right, so um, you're still a bit zoomed out, I think. I will let me go full screen. And do you want me to zoom in more? Is that better? It doesn't hasn't zoomed yet. Option plus or command plus. Really? On my on my screen, I'm zoomed in completely. I don't know. Are you sharing the right window? Do you see my uh, notebook or not? No. No, we just see the the screen before the notebook. You know the uh, list of uh, ionosphere, troposphere, and readme. Oh. Okay. So let me stop sharing. How about now? Now we see it. And is it uh, lovely and big? Very okay. good. Okay, that's uh, that's strange. All right. So um, um, I'm gonna now talk about ionosphere. Um, uh, that was that was about the troposphere. So I'm not going to go through this detail. I think I already talked about it, that there are different components. And that was about troposphere. Ionosphere is another layer that here is some tech maps from GPS and some modeling that shows, you know, for for the same time of the day, but but for two different dates, tech has changed. Tech means total electron content in the in the atmosphere. Tech has changed significantly with a, with a unit of tech U, which is uh, some uh, e to the power of 16 um, electron in cubic meters, uh, a column of uh, atmosphere. The difference between troposphere and ionosphere is if we propagate a um, electromagnetic wave through ionosphere, it will experience different delays at different frequencies. So if you have C band, and that's really because of this equation, if we open up the equations um, as, a, as a function of the delta range, which has component of displacement, geometry, tropospheric delay, which we talked about, ionosphere, uh, which is represented by this equation, then uh, you see that there is frequency, that's the radar frequency, carrier frequency in the, in the um, uh, denominator. So basically, if we have larger, fre uh, larger frequencies, uh, like um, basically expand uh, some, some 10 gigahertz, then uh, you would get smaller ionospheric delay for the same tech compared to L band, which is 1.2, 1.3 gigahertz, and you would get much larger. Uh, delay. So it's it's frequency dependent. All right. So that's that's where the opportunity is. That means what? If you are familiar with GPS, uh, that's how GPS estimates the um, ionosphere. Um, basically, GPS has two frequencies, L1 and L2, and the observations can be combined to, to estimate the ionospheric delay. Similarly, we want to do the same thing. We have one SAR image which has a bandwidth in range direction. Um, we, we mentioned um, for ELOS, for example, 14 megahertz data and 28 megahertz data. So there is a bandwidth and we have a center frequency. That's the L band, C band, X band, whatever. We wanna, we wanna split this um, bandwidth to two parts, which we call low band and high band. 
And then we end up, and we would do that for both a reference and secondary images. Then we would have low band um, uh, and high band SLCs for the reference and also low band and high band SLCs for the secondary. Then we could make interferogram between low band of the reference and low band of the secondary. So we get one low band interferogram and one interferogram between the high band of the reference and secondary. If we do, if we open up the equations using the, the, the um, uh, original equation that I showed at the top, we will get to these two equations where, uh, uh, where basically we can estimate the dispersive part of the, uh, of the interferometric phase by uh, combining the phase of the low, low band and high band and scaling by the center frequencies with this, with this coefficient. Uh, so that would be the dispersive part. Dispersive means the part that the, um, basically the, the delay is a function of the uh, frequency. And the non-dispersive part uh, would be represented by this one. So remember in that equation that I showed you, these, these components are all non-dispersive up to our knowledge, and that's a good approximation. Um, uh, but the, the ionosphere is, is the dispersive part. Uh, and then with that assumption, um, which, which, which so far is not too wrong, then we can estimate the ionospheric phase from the non-dispersive part. So uh, here, is, here is one example for, a, for an earthquake, Maule earthquake, magnitude 8.8, 8, 2010, um, somewhere in Chile. And you see that uh, basically the, uh, the, uh, the interferogram before any ionospheric phase uh, correction, and then the estimated ionospheric phase and the residual, which much better shows the uh, uh, co-seismic displacement. You see the trenches here, so you would expect more fringes here, and then going away from the trench, less, less density of fringes, while before correction, that was not the case really. We had a lot of fringes far from the trench, which did not make sense. Um, so you can go ahead and run this notebook if you want. Uh, what we are trying to do in this notebook is really uh, working on the data set from the first day, which was the Hawaii data set over um, uh, LOS1 data set over Hawaii. And we, we continue from there and um, set up the processing to, uh, to do ionospheric phase estimation. Uh, what we would add to the streetmap app.xml then would be do split spectrum and do dispersive. So do split spectrum is doing exactly that step that I, that I uh, discussed a few minutes ago where we split the spectrum, the range spectrum of the SLCs. So we will end up with two more SLCs for each of the acquisitions. And then do dispersive is really just um, when we have the interferograms from those subband SLCs, we, we just scale them and um, combine them to estimate the ionospheric phase. Uh, there is some one extra step that uh, you could turn on, which is do rubber sheeting. By that, we mean that um, uh, in, on, on Monday, we talked about uh, refining the geometrical offsets uh, between the uh, reference and secondary SLCs after geometrical co-registration. Basically, we, 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 we were running AMCOR, amplitude cross correlation, to find one constant offset. With rubber sheeting, we are doing the same thing, except now we are estimating the full image of the offsets in uh, you can you can you can um, uh, do this in azimuth or in range direction, and uh, you can add it back to the uh, uh, to the geometrical offsets. So it's it's not only a constant anymore; it's an image of the misregistration. And uh, in this case, usually 
not usually, but uh, for L-band data and over certain regions, for example, over Alaska, uh, polar regions, or over the um, uh, or over the uh, equatorial belts, you might need to do that. Um, so basically, the steps that we are uh, running in this notebook would be split range spectrum, subband resample, uh, which uh, clearly is doing splitting the spectrum and is uh, resampling those sub subband SLCs. It's going to generate the subband interferogram, uh, filter them, and um, unwrap the uh, low band and high band interferograms. I have already run this step, so I'm not going to redo it again. But the first step is really just uh, to uh, split the range spectrum. Um, it should it should work for you as well if you have already uh, modified the uh, um, the input configuration file. So in the low band, um, then you will end up with a with a subdirectory called split spectrum. Uh, which contains the low band SLC and high band SLC. And inside that, then you have both referen reference and secondary uh, subband SLCs. And then um, we, we already have all the uh, uh, co-registration offsets. So we, we just take them and we resample those subband uh, subband SLCs from the secondary to the to the reference image. That would be the next step. By the by the end of that step, it should it should usually go fast. In general, this notebook should should be fast if you if you run it and if you are following with me. The remaining will be making the subband interferograms now. We are very similar to what we did before, but this time we have uh, more interferograms. We already made one interferogram of the full range spectrum of the of the SLCs, and now this time we are um, making interferograms of those subbands. So if you if you try that, then uh, you will end up with subband interferograms with uh, that in the in the interferogram directory. Basically, you will uh, have low band and high band subdirectories, and the file namings are very similar to, to what you had already in the interferogram subdirectory. And then um, uh, we can, we need to filter them a little bit to help phase unwrapping. They have smaller range bandwidth, so they might be noisier. Uh, and uh, we definitely need to do some multi-looking and filtering um, to, to get some estimates. And um, finally, we let's take a look at some, some of the results. Here is the full band interferogram uh, from, from Monday, basically, the first session that we, we had the ice processing. Um, and then we have the low band interferogram and high band interferogram. And as you see, the, the, they are pretty, pretty sim similar. Um, 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 and somewhere we are looking, if you look at the differences, basically the differences are really, really small. We are looking at minus 2.5 to minus two radians. So there is some less than half radian variation here. But that small difference is what we have and what we are playing with to get to that um, ionospheric phase estimate. Anyways, we need to unwrap those subband interferograms. So that would be the next step. And finally, estimate the ionospheric phase. Um, I'm just gonna jump to the results. Sorry for scrolling. Um, and that would be basically the estimated dispersive phase and non-dispersive phase. You might have noticed that uh, it's very smooth, um, of course, because um, of the limited, that's one of the limitations of, the, of this approach that we have a limited bandwidth to play with. And if we look at the variance of the estimated ionospheric phase, which they exist in multiple literature, 
uh, you can see that there is a noise amplification as a function of the range bandwidth. We didn't have much bandwidth. We, we had only, in this case, I think 28 megahertz um, was the total bandwidth that we had. So that's not much. And um, since the two subbands are very close to each other, then um, uh, um, in, in theory, we, we would expect significant noise amplification. That's what we, we had. And uh, which means that the estimated ionospheric phase is just very noisy and much noisier than the regular interferograms. And we have to uh, filter and we have to filter heavily. Uh, so usually we do some Gaussian filtering, but yeah, that's the part that really um, uh, needs, needs may, maybe still um, uh, could, be, could be more improved. I mean, what, what would be the best way to filter? And uh, here is the back to the uh, original interferogram where we had the signal, the dike opening signal here, and some, some other real deformation signal, this circle. Uh, but also there was this phase ramp that, um, that is not really associated with any uh, geophysical, um, uh, at least on, on ground, um, uh, processes. Um, so it turned out that actually all those few fringes around four is due to the ionosphere. So on the right, I am showing the same interferogram after ionospheric phase correction. And the rest is really just geocoding. We can just geocode the same interferogram and uh, similar to what, what you have done before and you get the same, same interferogram. So you can, uh, you can also uh, take a look at uh, this part where we provide a little bit more um, flexibility. If you, I didn't do uh, rubber sheeting, so you could do that. You can do, you can control the filter kernel in X and Y direction. It's a Gaussian kernel and you can put um, different sigmas and the size of the kernel, you can rotate it um, to some degrees if you want. Uh, so there is there is a little bit um, flexibility to play with the filter at the configuration level if you want. Um, all right, that would be that would be the um, the notebook for the ionosphere as well. The homework for the ionosphere part is really just uh, try to run the ionospheric phase estimation and the Hawaii data set. So that would be the same notebook. And if you have uh, processed your own um, um, strip map uh, data, then it would be nice to apply ionospheric phase estimation also to your own data set. That would be the notebook, th that would be the homework for you. That's all I had and um, let me know if there is any question. I see a lot on the chat. I haven't looked at the chat yet, uh, at the details. Um, so I guess I could. Um, so, all right. Is there any specific question that I can still answer? Paul, Garrett, I see that you guys have answered most of them, I guess. Sorry, I'm listening to another telecon. What's going on now? <laughs> uh, we are done with the notebook. Um, I was asking if there is any question for me. I see that you have answered many of them with Garrett. Questions for Harash. I think we've addressed the questions that are in the chat pretty much. How does the filtering of the SLCs to get the low band and high band work? I didn't realize that this is going to have frequency information. Yeah, of course we have a we have a bandwidth. It's a that's the basics of the radar. So um, if you just basically the, the the basic is simple. If you just do an FFT of your SLC in range direction, um, then uh, you and you plot the magnitude of that 
um, uh, of the FFT results, you would get the spectrum of the SLC. So of course, the center of the spectrum is the radar frequency that um, you are playing with all the time, but there is a bandwidth around it, right? On the both sides of that center frequency. So we take um, each part of that spectrum and um, we, we demodulate and then we do IF, uh, basically inverse Fourier transform. That's really um, uh, basic um, bandpass filtering. Yeah, all from of the top covered part. in the SAR imaging theory notebook in excruciating detail. Uh, and to some extent in the SAR uh, phenomenology notebook that was part of the pre-course. Um, and I realized it was not entirely uh, required, but we did strongly encourage you to look at the uh, phenomenology one, at least, where it explains some of this stuff. Um, if you have further questions of the office hour on that particular aspect of filtering, the office hours this afternoon, we can go over it, maybe even in the notebooks themselves. All right, anything else? Otherwise, I made it on time. Oh, was it till 2.30 today? Or, oh, it's two. Yeah, how'd you do it so fast? You skipped one of the notebooks, that's why. <laughs> well, that one, is, that one is homework. Homework, exactly. Excellent. All right, the office hours, uh, the links were distributed in an email last week. Um, so uh, I don't know if, Melissa, that could, that could be sent out again, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I can send them out again. Do you want it? That, that would be great. Or do you want me to send an email? If you could send, um, you could put it on the Slack channel. I think everybody has access to that. Are they in the Slack? Uh, they are not, but I can put them in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know the best way to communicate it to the entire group. Uh, I'll put, I'll put it in the Slack and, uh, and I'll send an email. Just cover All right. That would be great. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. So for those of you who are interested in uh, spending more time today at five o'clock, there'll be uh, office hours uh, Pacific time. And uh, then we can reconvene again tomorrow also. Um, the Open SAR Lab will be available for probably another week or two after this course. But then there's, there's also, uh, in the UNAVCO instance, but there's also the normal Open SAR Lab uh, uh, instances that uh, don't quite support exactly these notebooks, but many of them do run in that environment. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.